All right, everybody, today we're going over the book Fall of Western Man by Mark Collette. And before I get into this, I just want to say I'm going to be pointing out a lot of little points, nitpicking a lot, but I, I want to make it clear. I have nothing against Mark. I've been following Patriotic Alternative for a number of years from a distance. I'm obviously on a whole different continent, so I can't exactly participate in their in-person events, but I enjoy their streams. I approve of what they do. I think they have a good core message, which is the British people do have a birthright to that island. Not only a birthright, but the birthright. Nobody else has a claim to it, and they should not be forced to sit back and watch that island get overrun with people from all corners of the world. Just wanted to get that out there, because I'm going to be going through this book with a fine-tooth comb, so I just wanted to clear up confusion so nobody thinks I'm trying to start drama or anything. That's not what I want to do. In fact, I really enjoy talking about this stuff, and I would be really happy if this prompts more conversations. And I did watch one of Mark Collette's recent streams before I recorded this, and he said something to the effect of, if everyone on the left had their way, they would line us all up against a wall next to each other, they would not make the distinction of Sivnat or Ethnonat or Conservative Libertarian. They would not see those labels or care about them at all. They would just see, oh, right of center, Nazi. And I, I really agree with that. And before I do get into this book, I thought it would be useful to outline exactly where my thinking differs from Mark Collette's. I think when we're analyzing who believes what, a good way to look at it would be to pinpoint what people think the cause is. The problems that we see are mostly observable. Almost everyone on the right agrees on those, and then what we think the solution is is another place people can differ. The problems are pretty plain to see. Mass migration, economic downturns, the weakening of Western nations' militaries, the weakening of our influence on the world stage, trans ideology, domestic unrest like Black Lives Matter, Antifa, that kind of thing. As far as the cause, some people say godlessness. Mark would say that the enemies of the West have been using their influence in media to degrade the Western mind for a period of decades, almost a century. Some people would say that a certain certain group of people is behind absolutely everything. My own thoughts on that would be more in line with Solzhenitsyn. I think we have collective societal guilt for that. If we look at our enemies in the media, our enemies in high positions, they absolutely do try to degrade the Western mind, but look at how they do it. Look at ShareBlue, look at Elizabeth Warren's meme team, look at the Hillary Clinton campaign, look at CNN getting caught out in so many lies. They do absolutely try to do it, but they are so incompetent. Just uh, analyze the term glowy. Someone who so obviously is connected with the U.S. federal government that they glow in the dark. They are not good at what they do, and that's to our benefit. But back to the point, I think at no point in all those decades was something completely out of our control. Every single thing, there is something that we as a society, as a people, could have done about it. I don't think it was done to us. I think we let it be done to us. And I think we do absolutely have the power to reverse it. Now, as far as solution goes, I actually haven't seen much specifically in this book in the way of concrete policy proposals for something the government should be doing. This book deals more with the psychological and spiritual side of things, the community building aspect of it, the idea that we as a people need to come together and organize specifically with people of our own race. And once we have a shared long-term goal ironed out, it would be much easier for us to iron out a bunch of short-term goals and then achieve them. As far as my thinking, using the vocabulary of this book, I think a race-based solution is much better suited to an African, a European, or an Asian superego. I think that the Americas and Australia it's just harder to fit race into the solution, into the personality of a society, into what criteria define if a person is from a particular nation. Are you Chinese? That's easy. I can tell that by sight. Are you Irish? That's easy. I can tell that by sight. Are you American? Okay, well, Americans come in all shapes and sizes, and even among those shapes and sizes, even with all the variety, you'll find that all those families have been here for hundreds of years. Are you Dominican? Okay, well, they come in quite a variety of shades. They range from tar black Haitian to downright Mediterranean skin tone, but even with all those differences in race and ethnicity, they all consider themselves Dominican. And I think the root cause for that difference in mentality between the Old World continents and the New World continents is the Old World continents have a much longer claim, much deeper roots to the land that they live on. The British can trace their ties to that land back thousands of years. 1066, Viking invasion, the invasion of the Romans. They can trace their ties to that land back at least five times longer than most American families have been living on our continent. So I think there is a concrete difference there, and if you don't believe me about that, I'll encourage you to Google and look up which countries have birthright citizenship, that is, which countries give citizenship automatically to babies born on their soil, regardless of the parent citizenship status. You'll find, if you look at a map of that, almost all the Old World Continent nations 
have something along the lines of the parents need to be citizens before we consider the child a citizen. And very, very many of the New World continents have something along the lines of, if you were born here, you're American. And I wouldn't even contest that in a lot of cases. If someone has spent more than two-thirds of their childhood here, they don't have any other place that feels more like home than this. They haven't been raised among another culture, they're American. If they have skin the color mocha and they speak Spanish at home, but they wave the American flag and they love the Bill of Rights, hey, welcome in. Being an American is not defined by race, it's defined by a set of ideals, and being British in contrast, that is very much defined by race. So that's where I think ethno-nationalist groups like Patriotic Alternative fit in much more in a European context than in an American context. Now, throughout this book review, I will play something that I'll call the devil's advocate game. That is, whether or not we're crazy, whether or not we're overreacting to something that's not there, whether or not there is a cabal of elites, a man behind the curtain, so to speak, organizing and planning out all the societal ills that we're facing. And I'll, I'll stop periodically and pick apart various ideas with this question. And again, I'm not doing it to disagree. I'm not doing it to start drama. In some cases, I would even agree that there is some group trying to orchestrate something. In a lot of cases, I'm really not sure. I don't think that there's one shadowy secret figure like a Rothschild or something who is secretly running all these different groups as a secret one world government. I think the UN has different goals, but a lot of overlapping goals with the EU. They have different goals, but a lot of overlapping goals with the American military industrial complex. They have different goals, but a lot of overlapping goals with Hollywood. Would. They have different goals, but a lot of overlapping goals with the Israeli government. So there's a lot of different groups out there. They each want their own thing, but they just have overlap. They have enough shared ground that they can form temporary alliances with each other. If you know anything about the nitty gritty of intersectional thinking, intersectional feminism, I think it is a lot like that, where there's no central control. It's just all these groups working together in as much as they have shared common ground. They have intersecting interests, as the leftist would say. And I think the devil's advocate game is important to play not just in book reviews, but whenever we think about politics, because it keeps us from getting stupid, really. It keeps us from purity spiraling downward. It keeps us from jumping to conclusions and assuming something that's wildly unlikely when there's an easier explanation for what happened. And really, I think it's good practice to, rather than strawmanning our enemies, I think it's good practice to see their point, to give them as strong an argument as we can before we refute it. Because giving ourselves a bigger challenge before we overcome it, that makes us stronger. So now that I've rambled on a lot, let's get into the book. The author says that mass migration and demographic shift are destroying the West, but that's only a symptom of the problem. The enemies of the West have damaged the Western psyche. Here's a direct quote. This book is not concerned with listing names of people who have pushed such degeneracy on the West. This would be unproductive and could easily fill dozens of books. The purpose of this book is to analyze the ways in which Western man has been misguided and lost his way, and the way that structures that once held Western society together have been undermined and eroded or perverted. And that is a good subject matter for this book. I don't think it's necessarily presenting new ideas to go into the nitty-gritty of every single person ever who's pushed something degenerate on the West, and I think it is important to understand, in a broader sense, how this happened. The author, like I said, believes that enemies in the West who have taken over certain institutions are using their power in the media and their influence in those institutions to attack the psyche of the West. Quote, the enemies of the West have not attacked Western man in an overt and physical way, but in a devious series of attacks aimed at the mind, unquote. And the author believes that these mental attacks are designed to weaken us to make us easier to conquer, quote, the subtle manipulation of Western man's mind by his enemies, those who wish to see the West crumble, has altered the behavior of Western man and has both robbed him of the traits that made him great and strong, and at the same time, unlocked and fed negative traits in order to make him degenerate and weak." Unquote. Don't be weak and gay. And I do think it's a nice touch that the author uses the term enemies of the West rather than using any other term for them. Many people, very many people, associate a certain race and religion with control of the media, control of banks. And well, yes, many of the people in those positions do have that in common. I don't think that's the root cause. I think there's more to the story. And I think that not all people, certainly most people of that race and religion, 
are not in on the game. I think that's just how nepotism works. If someone gets into a position of power, they're going to want to hire their friends before they hire a complete stranger who sent in a job application. And it just happened to be this one group. And I don't think that's necessarily an accident. I do think that one group is just naturally talented in a business and in a social sense. So I think it does make sense that they got into politics and the media and finance. I think that their being part of that one group does influence the way that they behave. I don't think it's productive to say that all members of this one group are the problem, when there's so many that just want to live normal lives. This book does something interesting, and I've, I've read this book two and a half times now, and I'm still puzzled over why he chose to do this. It uses the Freudian vocabulary of id, ego, and superego to outline almost all of its ideas. And I do think it paints a good picture of what he's trying to get across. I think it just puts off a first-time reader if they see Freudian vocabulary in this. Freud was a member of the Frankfurt School. He was someone who tried to push degeneracy on society, tried to make normal things into being weird, and tried to make weird things into being normal. And even in academics, Freud is wildly discredited, wildly discredited. I studied psychology at a four-year university at one of these liberal arts schools, and we were told Freudian psychoanalysis, it's a fun game, but it's like, it's not any better at the end of the day than the people who do the personality test things with the four letters. It's just a product of Freud's imagination. It was revealed to me in a dream, so to speak. It's not scientific. The scientific process did not go into this. So I question whether it was a good idea to use these terms, because I think they will put off readers a lot, but even the author says at one point it's a basic outline that provides a good understanding. I think that's a good way to say it. I agree, it is a basic outline and it does provide good understanding. So defining these terms, the id is the pleasure center of the brain. The id is the part that says, oh, monkey want food, monkey want sex, monkey want water. The id is the thing that governs basic biological urges. The ego is the thing that says, oh yes, monkey want food, but monkey also see there's a lion eating food. If monkey steal lion's food, monkey get eaten by lion. The ego protects us from danger. And the superego, the author says, is something that unique to humans. The superego is what gives us a higher purpose. It's a thing that's able to override the id and the ego and force us to sacrifice ourselves for higher goals. So restating the basic ideas of the book with this vocabulary, the enemies of the West have realized that the Western collective superego, the set of collective values that Western society shares, the enemies have realized that is too strong and they need to destroy the Western superego before they can have success in any other kind of attack. And he outlines the vast importance of this Western superego. It connects past generations to present, and it transmits tradition. It's a collection of ways of thinking, ways of doing things. It's a collection of values and ideals. And it's transmitted through parents, through role models, through institutions. And the author says that the superego is what gives us a conscience and what enforces compliance with the unwritten rules of society. One might bring in social contract theory, here. What I will instead bring in is the religious term natural law. And natural law is a set of things that, a set of right and wrong judgments that all humans from all cultures have in common. It's wrong to murder, it's wrong to steal, on and on. It's a good thing to have a family, it's a good thing to build something rather than tearing something down on and on. It's just right because it is, it's just wrong because it is, nobody needs to tell us why it's right or wrong. There doesn't need to be a reason it's just right or it's just wrong. The author says that societal superego is the thing that's responsible for transmitting morality. I think it's much older than that. I think a lot of our values, a lot of our moral judgments come from God just by virtue of us being human. The author will also say later in this book that the nuclear family, the, the family structure of mother, father, child, the author says that this evolved in Europe as a survival mechanism, a way to make it easier to get through harsh winters. And I'll say yes and no to this. While it is true that cultures in warmer climates, we're looking at Africa, we're looking at Central America, Caribbean, there are a lot of cultures there that practice polygamy, that is a man marrying more than one wife. But even there, it's the idea of pair bonding for life. There's that ideal, there's that stated goal, even if it almost never happens in some of these places, 
of a man and a woman raising a child and then staying together even after that child is an adult, staying together for the rest of their lives. So I think, yes, that harsh European winters did do a lot to reinforce that natural selection, reinforce that towards people who are absolutely serious about staying together for life. No one else, only you, no divorce. But I think that's definitely not a thing that's exclusive to Europeans. I would say that's one of those things that comes down to natural law, one of those things that all humans have in common, that ideal. The author says a lot about the importance of both a mother and a father in a child's life, Quote, youngsters who have grown up with order and discipline from a strong father figure and love and compassion from their mother follow a path similar to that of their parents, choosing to emulate them and follow in their footsteps. Unquote. He says that this is, for the most part, how superego is transmitted between generations. And he says a lot about the importance of that superego to society. Quote, a society or community that works together towards a common goal is one that succeeds and advances. A society made up solely of individuals who pursue their own selfish ends and goals is one that fractures into smaller interest groups, unquote. And throughout the book, he compares over and over again a society to a beehive. Bees are extremely collective creatures. They willingly sacrifice themselves for the good of the hive. And he says that our societies need to work to be like a beehive, always thinking about the greater good and always ready to sacrifice our own short-term pleasure for the good of the wider community. Something I will say, I think that religion is the most powerful superego humans have ever known. Nationalism is also definitely high on the list, but I think religion is and should be the be-all and end-all. I think Christianity is the most complete religion, the most complete set of truth that exists. I think while this book is absolutely a great outline for how to conduct yourself in society, I think it's missing a lot that religion does provide. Towards the end of this book, in the conclusion, it became very clear to me that the author did look at Christian theology when setting up his ideology when outlining the things that he planned to put in this book, but I think the spiritual side of things should not be left out lightly. I will say, as far as me myself goes, it's, it's very comforting to be able to lean on a set of morals that you're confident has absolute truth. Even if I don't know the reason for one of the rules outlined in the Bible, I'm confident that there is a good reason, or at least that there was at some point. After thousands of years, people are still using this book to outline how to find goodness, not just temporary pleasure, not just felicity, but spiritual, soul-fulfilling goodness. Family, community, love is the key word if we're talking about the Bible. And I think it's comforting to know that even if I don't know something, there is that base that I can fall back to. I forget where exactly in scripture it says this, but I know there's something to the effect of Christ makes fools into wise men and makes wise men into fools. That is very true. What I will hypothesize as to where spirituality fits into a completely fleshed out ideology, I think not everyone is gonna get it if we only talk about personal responsibility without talking about the next world or the afterlife or what comes next or even the role of evil spirits in orchestrating the bad things that happen in this world. I think adding that on to our talking points opens us up to being listened to by so many more people. Man, I would love to do a book review of a Frank Peretti book at some point. After the introduction, the author goes into a chapter on the perfect society and what that looks like. Quote, the perfect society can be defined as a homogenous group of people who come together with shared morals, shared values, and a wish to move forward as one, working together for the good of the community whilst not forgetting the rights and importance of the individual." Unquote. I think that is a pretty good definition. It hits on all the important parts. I can definitely appreciate that the balance between the good of the community and the rights of the individual is mentioned. And when he says homogenous there, I can tell he's referring to race, but I don't think that needs to be exclusively in reference to race. It can be homogenous in other ways too, and thinking back on other parts of the book, there are parts where he describes different groups pulling in different directions, and so progress isn't being made in one direction because the community isn't unified. Those groups can be distinguished by things other than race, religion for example, sets of values and morals, but race is certainly a part of it. The author says societies with common goals function far more efficiently, no argument there. Another quote, equality is not the basis of a smooth running and well-functioning society. In any successful society, there is always a division of labor and the existence of structural hierarchies, just as there is in the natural world, unquote. Again, no disagreement there. Specialization of labor is the thing that allowed us to advance past the hunter-gatherer stage in human development. And with that necessitates different social classes, sometimes even different 
castes, and with those different social classifications, those different stratifications, it's going to impact the way people interact with each other. He encourages the reader to pursue the path of self-improvement for the good of the group. And bringing it back to that Freudian vocabulary, we must resist the id and actively choose to follow the superego. Once again, don't be weak and gay. And now here's the part I found interesting about this chapter. Collectivism with strong societal superego rejects both capitalism and communism. And the author seems to be writing about the spirit behind each of those ideologies here. He says capitalism puts individual goals above that of the collective, and communism puts equality above that of the collective. Now that is an interesting viewpoint I wouldn't have really considered. I've seen only one thinker before claim to reject both a capitalist and a communist model. That was Muammar Gaddafi, actually. That guy was an absolute nutcase. I actually have a lengthy video about his early life on my channel. You can go look that up. But that's not the point. I do understand what the author is getting at with capitalism emphasizing individual goals, and we do see that play out in the modern day. The CEOs of these companies aren't necessarily paid to care about the health of the society. They're paid to sell burgers. And sometimes even in the woke era, they're not paid necessarily to even sell burgers. They're paid DEI bucks to sell propaganda. Sometimes, not always. But my view of capitalism is it's the thing that human societies always default to. If every government in the world collapsed tomorrow, you would get people exchanging gold, silver, and sometimes copper for goods and services. And even in some of these former Soviet states, at times when the communist system broke down, people used black market capitalism to get food. And I, I think it really comes down to how we define capitalism. And I think the way I'm used to thinking about it is a much broader definition than what the author here sees it as. Big picture, I do think I understand his point at least. I think it has to do with the intention behind these exchanges, whether someone's goal is to just force their way up the ladder of success or whether their goal is to actually do something that's good for the broader society. And when I say it like that, now that I think of it, I'm just thinking out loud here. That might even be something we have to examine on a person-by-person -person basis. Based on from what I read here, I would say the author would probably advocate to instill the superego into children before laziness sets in, whereas capitalism, as I understand it, would seek to get productivity out of even lazy people because it forces them to earn money to survive. And then one could debate nature versus nurture. Are people just inherently lazy or productive more or less so than each other? I don't really have the answer to that one. It's probably a good mix of both. Next up, the author gets into talking about broken societies, imperfect societies, specifically societies that are broken in the way that many in the West are, ones that are not homogenous, ones that have several different racial groups living in them. He compares it to a beehive consisting of many different colonies, each altering each other's work. Now, I would say this sounds almost exactly what political parties do, but I do see how someone could compare that to different racial blocks in a society. I don't think it's that out of place to make that comparison. And specifically in America, I see people talking about the Hispanic voting bloc or the black voting bloc, and I see the demographics or destiny people talking about how the white race in America is apparently doomed because Hispanics and blacks will never vote our way. But I don't see it that way for a few reasons. First up, looking at the voting trends since 2016, Hispanics have been going more and more split, and it's to the point where they're pretty much split evenly between Republican and Democrat, at least in how they vote, not necessarily in how they're registered to vote. And hey, even blacks, I think in the next 20 years it's going to look a lot different with how the black voting bloc is made up. I think that particular voting bloc is either going to flip largely, or we might see an even split with it. I think it's more likely to be somewhat of a split. But the other reason I don't like using the terminology of voting in one race's self-interest or another, specifically in America, is because I certainly see us as having an American self-interest, a self-interest for the citizens of this nation, but I don't necessarily equate that with race. I know, and I see where they come from, the people who make the argument that America is or historically has been a white country, but I just don't agree with that. Now, if you want to say that Trump's immigration policy is good for whites and I say it's good for the country, well, good for us then. We're both voting Trump. I just think American culture historically always has been much more than just the white race. And even if we're talking about the white race, what kind of white? We have Italians, Irish, Germans. These groups have not always looked and sounded the same throughout American history, and they have not always gotten along. I will get to much more on that in just a few minutes. Another quote from the book, religious buildings, cultural centers, and other services are built to serve that particular group, but are of little or no use to other groups within the wider society. People from particular groups 
then cluster around areas where their community is better represented, unquote. And I absolutely see where the author is coming from with that. I've been to Scotland, I've seen Muslim areas with mosques and everything. I've been to Philly and seen Chinatown. I've been to the Bronx, I've seen areas that almost entirely speak Spanish, areas where a lot of people don't understand English. And the author also brings up this point, people choose to associate with those who look and act similar to them. And essentially it's voluntary segregation. And yeah, that is the truth, that does happen. But here's the quote that I wanted to dig into, quote, to integrate one culture into another means compromises must be made, which inevitably means giving up or diluting parts of one or both of the different cultures being integrated." Unquote. Now there's something I say from time to time, which is America is indeed the great melting pot. We've all heard that phrase growing up. And I use it to mean that America has historically been better at integrating these various groups than other countries. At least that's the way I see it. That's a subjective judgment. But to give examples of this, and to speak to what I was talking about a few minutes ago when I said I would get around to that, I've read a good amount of the things that Henry Ford wrote, and among his autobiographies, there's two of them, Today and Tomorrow and My Life at Work. He talks at length about the different demographics that make up the population of his shop and his company town, the groups that make up his factories, and he talks about having some mild problems with people in the company town who rent out extra beds in their housing units, and they all live in cramped together like that in the interest of saving money. Now, the group in America that does this today are Hispanics. It is hard to find an apartment in the Bronx that does not house more people than it should, more people than the builders envisioned for it. Ford, though, is talking about white immigrants here, Polish, Germans, etc. And this example is from 1920s, 1930s. I'll give an even better example. From the 1880s, there was a guy named Jacob Rees. And this guy's whole thing, he was a journalist. He wanted to go into New York City and write a whole piece about, oh, look at all the squalor, look at the cramped living conditions, dirty air, the tiny floor space that these people are forced to live in, all the fire hazards, all the poverty, yada yada. So he wanted to go in and do the progressive thing where he advocated for housing reform in New York City. So he, he went in there, he took a lot of pictures, he wrote several books. But the result of that work is something that we can look at today. He wrote very detailed accounts, very detailed of which communities lived on which blocks and what their habits were, what their businesses were like. Talked about open-air street markets where people would haggle and slaughter goats right on the street. Talked about all these communities that spoke each one a different language. Now that was New York City in the 1880s. Do you want to guess what kinds of different racial groups made up that city at that time? We're talking about Italians, Irish, Germans, Polish, Russian Jews, Blacks. So, in the past 140 years, the city has gotten considerably less white. Instead of like half a dozen different languages, you'll find, for the most part, two. There may be some tiny enclaves where people speak other languages than English or Spanish. And in that same time, living conditions have gotten better. Everything's gotten more clean. If you can imagine New York City being dirtier than it is today, somehow it was. It's a lot worse today than it was in the 80s, don't get me wrong. But it's a lot better than it was in the 1880s. And I bring up that example to illustrate the point, where are all these different ethnic groups today? If you see a Polish person on the streets of America, you cannot tell that person apart from an Irishman or a German. If you listen to their accent, if you look at the inside of their home, if you look at the stores they go to, the things they do with their family. An Italian is nearly identical to an Irishman, is nearly identical to a German, on and on. In fact, the most we're gonna get from one of those groups is every St. Patrick's Day, all the Irish descendants, the people whose families used to be Irish, they go out and they pretend that they're still Irish and they get drunk. But that's all you're gonna get. And let's see, sometimes you'll get the pizza shop with the grandfather who still speaks Italian. That's that's it as far as these groups holding on to their cultural heritage. They have assimilated into wider America. And using that example, I'm going to give something that might be a white pill or a massive black pill, depending on who's listening and what your opinions on race are. America has very large amounts of Hispanics currently. What are they going to look like in a hundred years? Well, I can tell you, even now, the ones that were born here and they grew up and they're in their 20s now, what did they learn in school? Think back to, like, third grade when you were learning about nouns and verbs and adjectives. That's what they learned in school, and they learned that in English, but they did not learn that in Spanish. Yeah, they may speak Spanish at home, but a lot of them, the best they're likely to speak is street Spanish. 
The ones that were born here and grew up here don't often know the underlying grammar rules. And their kids, even if they do speak Spanish at home, they won't know those underlying grammar rules either. But they know the grammar rules for English. So I think in our lifetimes we're going to start seeing a lot more Hispanic people speaking English at home, assimilating into the wider culture, getting that suburban house or maybe even the rural home. And a hundred years from now we're going to see more people who have an olive complexion, but those people are not going to sound different from the next person. They're not going to have a different accent, they're not going to go to different stores, they're not going to do different activities with their families. I am very confident America will assimilate these people. That is, though, provided that we can close the massive influx of people that we have currently close the border. But I think Trump will be elected, and I think he's going to find a way to do it. So I would put the odds in our favor on that one, too. Next up, the author writes a lot about the family unit, specifically how the societal superego is passed down from father to child. So when a child grows up without a father, it's essentially cutting their ties with past generations and losing tradition when they grow up that way. He says that when the father is missing in a single parent home, it causes chaotic kids. And I do not disagree there. He says that the enemies of the West understand the power, understand the importance of a two-parent home, and that's why they injected feminism into the culture in order to break up two-parent homes, in order to encourage people to be single mothers, in, in order to encourage people to follow their ids, be promiscuous, not think about tomorrow. Tomorrow. And more than that, it degrades the role of the father. And that is one of the places where I will play that devil's advocate game. Is there really a man behind the curtain? Yes, feminism is bad for society, promotes single parenthood, degrades the role of the father, but was that intentional? Is there truly one mastermind or a group of masterminds orchestrating so much media over the course of hundreds of years in order to do that to our society? Or was it just people organically having stupid ideas and giving positive affirmations to each other's stupid ideas, and then doubling down on that. The id, after all, is a powerful force, and if someone really wants to follow their id, believe me, they will jump through all sorts of mental hoops in order to justify it to themselves more than to others. They need to build up a whole ideology around that in order to sleep at night. In their mind, they know they're breaking natural law, they know they're doing something wrong, but they need to feel like it's right, so they try to logic their way into feeling like it's right. But the soul remains empty. And the story of Exodus is a wonderful illustration of this, how often, how long, how consistently Pharaoh's heart has been hardened. How many times he doubled down on that and caused such massive harm to his own people. So as far as whether or not I think someone a hundred years ago or 150 years ago planned out the course that Western media would take. I'm pretty skeptical of that idea. Whether or not there's someone now doing it, yeah, there probably is. But here's the thing, there doesn't need to be because the culture does it to ourselves. We've done it to ourselves. There is a consumer demand for LGBTQ plus books. Otherwise, that wouldn't be an entire genre on the Amazon bookstore. There is a customer demand for degenerate TV shows, degenerate movies. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so many out there and they wouldn't be making so much money. It's not Jews or Satanists or elites or whatever you want to call it shoving this stuff down our throats. We allow it to be shoved down our throats. More than that, we as a society ask for it to be. And there may be someone sitting on top of the Hollywood food chain thinking that they're all powerful. There probably is someone doing that. But here's the thing, they don't have the power, not at all. We the people have the power if we tomorrow decide to wake up and, using the author's vocabulary, stop following the id, abandon the logical mental justifications we make for following the id. If we wake up tomorrow and stop doing that, then suddenly that shark at the top of the Hollywood food chain would be nothing. So anyone listening, it's not something that someone else has done to us. It's something that we can choose at any moment to stop having done to us. The author speaks more about marriage, and he writes that the ultimate end goal of marriage, it's all for the kids. The institution of marriage is there to provide a safety net for the children. It is there to provide structure for their upbringing. It's there to provide both the loving kindness from a mother and the stern discipline from a father in order to properly shape that child as they grow into a functional human being. I will say yes, but. And I will say this is something that I fall into so, so often. Over describing the utilitarian aspect of these things, I honestly think that's a masculine trait. And it's something that will get your work a lot of attention if you're looking for only a male audience. But the other part of it, the flip side of the coin, love, the emotional side of it, the spiritual fulfillment from having a family, that's the thing that's missing from describing the entire family unit that way. 
And that's also one of the areas where I think this particular ideology would benefit from having Jesus Christ injected into it. Love is the be-all and the end-all, according to Christianity, that we should be chasing, and God will orchestrate the rest. All we have to do is seek to follow God, seek to order our lives in a way that God would approve of. And that also has the added benefit of avoiding some of the pitfalls that might come from feeling pressure to marry feeling pressure from thinking too much about that utilitarian aspect of it, and maybe rushing into it, maybe marrying the wrong person. I think that's something that relying on God could definitely help with. Now here's something that I don't quite agree with, but I honestly do feel a little unprepared to respond to. The author writes that the nuclear family, the two-parent home, is a product of evolutionary pressure which started after our ancestors got to Europe. He writes that it is a uniquely European thing, and that it was largely a result of people going into that arrangement for the safety, the financial security of having someone to rely on during the winter, during the harsh European winters. I don't buy that, but I find myself at a loss to come up with good, solid examples to contradict it. I will lean on the Bible here and say that pair bonding is a human urge. People instinctively desire to be with only one romantic partner for life. It's part of natural law, meaning that if someone breaks that pattern, they feel that nagging voice in the back of their head telling them they're doing something wrong. It's just something that all humans humans recognize to be wrong. It doesn't need a reason why it's wrong, it's just wrong to do. And yes, I recognize that there are polygamous cultures out there, I recognize that there are communal cultures out there that just share women that just freely fornicate with each other, and the kids are raised by the community and they don't know which person is their father. Yes, I know that sort of thing happens closer to the equator more often than not, but I will say the overwhelming majority of people in the entire globe see a two-parent household as the ideal. And it's more than just harsh winners that provide evolutionary pressure for that. There is the avoidance of STDs, there is the added security of having a second parent actively involved, actively invested in making sure this child survives to adulthood. And there is the mental effect on the child of having that second parent there during their childhood. I definitely don't see this as something that's unique to Europeans. Perhaps it's more prominent in Europeans for the same reason the author describes, the harsh winners, but it's definitely not an exclusive European thing. There gets to a point in the book where the author talks about role models, specifically the absence of positive role models in the modern day. He talks about how role models who send a positive message, who effectively transmit the superego, are taken out of the public awareness. Think about all the statues we've seen taken down in America. But not only that, celebrities. I couldn't help but think of Chris Pratt, one of the few normal, wholesome people in Hollywood, one of the few Christians in Hollywood, and he is constantly mocked, and that's one of the points. Any positive role model out there, any potential positive role model out there, is mocked mercilessly. But in this vacuum of positive role models, the author talks about kids searching for guidance, because they instinctively know that they should have role models to look up to, and then the enemies of the West filling that vacuum with their own negative role models. And he gives a few examples here that I want to stop and talk about. Specifically, he gives two pop music examples. The first one is a song by Lady Gaga. God Just Dance. He goes through and breaks down the lyrics, which honestly, as many times as I've heard the song, I didn't really give thought to the lyrics until I saw them written down in this book. If you don't know the song, you probably know the tune. Just dance, gonna be okay. Do 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 and just dance. Yeah, that one. And it's a song about a girl in the club who gets too drunk to know where she is. It's club music, basically. Now, this feeling could just be me, but I don't think it's just me. With the caveat that it is very hard to find any music ever that I don't like, I think I speak for more than just myself when I say that I get his point, but we could have communicated that point with a better example than this. I think it comes across as just grumpy old man old kids these days. Like, if someone isn't used to thinking about politics and then they peek their head into this world just for one second and then this is the first thing they see, they're gonna shake their head and turn around and walk right back to their normal life. And again, I do understand what he's saying about the lyrics, but more than anything, this reminds me of a guy named Philip Zimbardo. I know who he is because I took AP Psych in high school and then I went on to have a psych minor in college. He's the guy that in your Psych 101 class they probably have a section about experiments with questionable ethics, and then they talk about the Stanford Prison Experiment where they had the students dress up as either prisoners or guards and they role-played for weeks on end, and then they had to cut the experiment off early because the prisoners were being treated too brutally. The guy that ran that experiment, that guy is Philip Zimbardo, he gave a TED Talk once 
Wars. I never heard about it before going down a random TED Talk rabbit hole on YouTube a few years ago, and for good reason. This guy, who made a name for himself in the world of psychology, he gives a TED Talk, comes out, starts talking about porn addiction. And he approaches it in the most curmudgeonly old man way. He breaks it down. Okay, this is the number of hours per week the average young man watches pornography. And then if you add all this up, this is the number of hours per month. This is the number of hours per year. You could earn a whole college degree in that time. And it just comes across as something your parents would rant to you about when you know for a fact they did the exact same thing when they were young. I mean, he's right, but it just doesn't come across well when he puts it like that. So I just want to present this open-ended question. How can we present messages like this in a better way, in a way that is more likely to grab attention from young people and from people who are not spending a lot of time thinking about politics? And there's even another music example after this. Another pop song, Katy Perry. The song title is Shout Out To. I have not heard this one actually, but the author goes over how these song lyrics are calling out to the audience, specifically calling out to people whose rent is late, for example, people who don't know where their car is the next morning, for example, stuff like that. So again, a party song. And the author goes over how these call-outs, these shout-outs, make the listener feel like they can relate to the role model who is singing. Now, as far as these music examples go, there's a few things I want to bring up. First is, once again, let's play that devil's advocate game. Are songs with lyrics about getting drunk at a dance club popular? because there is some top-down effort to push this kind of thing on society or because society has a market demand for it. I would say more so the latter than the former, actually. I would say there may very well be someone at the top rubbing their hands together saying, Oh ho ho, I know just what I'm gonna push on these kids today. But I think any power that person has is an illusion. I think we do it to ourselves. And the second thing I want to bring up is, how much do these lyrics really have an effect on society? As I said, it's very hard to find any music ever that I don't like, and perhaps because of that, I'm very much in the camp of music is just music. And in fact, for similar reasons, violent video games do not turn people into serial killers. I started going to church a few years back, and I still listen to Avenged Sevenfold, and I've even talked to people at church about this. There's people who feel like that kind of music affects their mindset, and they choose not to listen to it for that reason. I wouldn't necessarily say the same, and we're able to agree to disagree on that. Or maybe that's not the best way to say it. We're able to agree that we are different people who are affected different ways by music. And if that person hears a song that evokes images of dark and violent things, they can easily choose not to listen to it. Now, one could argue if someone is susceptible to music like that, for that person it would be more tempting not to turn off the song about parties and sex and drugs than it would be the song about violence and blood and stuff like that. And that may be a fair point. But even so, I will say, if that person who chooses to listen to that doesn't organically realize what's wrong with it, it's wrong to try to force that music out of the world until everyone understands why. We shouldn't just go around trying to ban those songs when there's lots of people out there there who see nothing wrong with it. We're going to be known as the people who try to ban having fun. We need to change enough minds on the ground level that we don't even need to ban it because people choose to avoid those things by themselves. But back to my point about some people being more or less susceptible to music than others. Me, music head, one of my guilty pleasures is Kesha. She puts out a lot of club music like this. I've only ever been clubbing once in my life, but I enjoy the music. I enjoy upbeat sounds. I listen to it, you know, in the car. I listen to it while making breakfast. I don't model my life after that, for the same reason I don't go join the army after playing Call of Duty. But even if I did, looking at Kesha for a second, I see stories online, I don't know if they're true or not, that what she does for fun is she goes to universities and she sits in lecture halls just listening to a class that she hasn't enrolled for. So as far as destructive role models go, there are worse that can be had. And I will definitely say a lot more about music later on in this book review. But moving on from music and pop stars to institutions. National Heroes is one example. The author gives examples of British national heroes who have been either mocked or discredited or forgotten. I'll give some American examples. Thomas Jefferson and Robert E. Lee are mocked because of their association with slavery. George Washington, surprisingly untainted, I would say. Audie Murphy, forgotten. Alexander Hamilton, praised actually, surprisingly, but not surprising as it should be because of his circumstances growing up and because he's the most federalist of our founding fathers. Jefferson on the other hand, being one of the least Federalist. In the play Hamilton, he's presented as sort of backwards, sort of, I want to say redneck, but 
that's not quite the right word. If you've ever listened to Hamilton, you know what I mean. William Penn is a good one, actually. He's forgotten. Henry Ford, mocked and discredited. More than just national heroes, the church and the school used to be important institutions for transmitting the superego to young people. The church in modern society has become a shameful thing to be associated with. However, I will note, if Christians are not being mocked by the outward, worldly, sinful society, then we are doing something wrong. Our kingdom is not of this world. We are not a culture that follows the flesh. We follow a figure who the world rejects. Christianity by design is meant to be a counterculture. But more than just being mocked, though, we see, you know, the, those TikTok videos about the pastors with the whole pride flag and everything. I have my suspicions that some of those videos, maybe even a lot of those videos, are part of a top-down effort. I won't even play the devil's advocate game about that one because, let's be honest, it glows. The author mentions police authority has been degraded, and the author has a lot to say about scouts, you know, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts of America. Of course, the Boy Scouts started letting trans people in, and now they're just the Scouts. I saw a Babylon Bee article saying that the Scouts renamed themselves, and they removed every word from the name except the. Babylon Bee is super hit or miss, but back to the point, the author goes into how the enemies of the West try their darndest to pervert these institutions and turn them into things that transmit a negative super ego instead of a positive one. And even if they can't do that, they mock the institutions. And I want to talk about a term here that this idea doesn't really fit in anywhere, so I'll just talk about it now. The term collective conscience, as mentioned in the book. The author would say that conscience is a thing that's part of the superego that's transmitted culture to culture. I, of course, would say that a large part of what we understand to be right or wrong comes from natural law, and it's something that all or most humans have in common. But more than that, I wanted to touch on interpretation of Genesis, interpretation of all the rules of, you know, the Ten Commandments, Leviticus, all those silly rules. A lot of people, when they get hung up about thinking the church as an institution exists to just try to control people and try to limit everyone's freedom because they can, depending on the congregation, sometimes that's true, but I think there's another way to interpret Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus that not a lot of people think of. A lot of people read it and assume automatically that it's prescriptive, meaning that we're getting a set of rules to follow. A third party, God, is giving these rules, and we're supposed to follow these rules even even though we don't want to. But the other way to look at it is it's descriptive of human nature. These rules are there for a reason, because ordering society in a way that all these rules are followed, in light of this burst of intelligence that humans found ourselves with, this enhanced brain size that evolution gave us, this cognitive ability that separates us from lesser animals. We have to make sense of this, and one of the best ways in history that our ancestors have made sense of it is outlined in Genesis, a set of rules that if we follow these rules rather than just giving into our id every day like the monkeys do. It produces a society where everyone can work together harmoniously rather than just constant conflict whenever someone has a whim for it. For example, if you see your sexual partner going out and sleeping with a lot of other people, that produces the emotion of jealousy. The solution to that, to avoid bloodshed, to avoid that violence in competition for that mate, is to select one mate for life. And that also approaches the place where I think Islam is the religion for men, and Christianity is the religion geared for all people. Fathers don't want to see their daughters treated as property. Fathers don't want to see their daughters as one of a number of wives for the same man. Christianity says that both the husband and the wife are important in the family unit. If you look at the Genesis passage where it says that Eve will be a partner for Adam, I love comparing different language translations of the Bible. In French, that word partner is the same word that they use for a double-sided door, so male and female are different different, but they're complementary. They are perfectly complementary, actually. God designed man and woman to be the perfect teammates for each other in this thing that we call life. So that's maybe a better defense of why I think pair bonding is something that's universal to all humans, rather than something that was evolved in Europe as a result of cold winters. The author has a chapter on feminism. He says that the goal of feminism is to break up the two-parent household and decrease the Western birth rate. We could play the devil's advocate game there and talk about whether or not feminism is a top down or a bottom-up social movement, but I think we beat that horse already. Nevertheless, I do agree on the harms that feminism has caused. Quote from the book, Make no mistake, feminism is an ideology of hate. Hate for natural, strong, masculine males, but also hate for the natural, loving, and feminine female. End quote. Another quote, The whole overarching thought process behind feminism 
sets men up as the natural enemy and oppressor of the female, and who in their right mind would choose to settle and form a lifelong bond with their enemy and oppressor." Unquote. Both those things are true. Feminism creates an antagonistic relationship between the two sexes. And there's a few different ways this is played out, a few different directions these thoughts can go. First is the effect on the family unit, which I think me and the author would agree that this is the most important one. Both the father and the mother have an equally important role in the family unit. I talked about just a few minutes ago Genesis and how male and female are perfectly compatible for one another. And the author has talked at length about the psychological effect on the children of growing up in a one-parent household, talking about how the children need love and compassion for the mother in order to be well-adjusted emotionally, and how the father is the source of the superego. He says that feminism attacks that feminine role, encourages the mother to be less loving and compassionate and more masculine as she pursues masculine career paths. But also he'll get into in a later chapter, talking about how the father as well has been emasculated. They seek to encourage feminine traits in men. And I salute the way that the author rebuffed the claim that men and women are natural enemies to one another, and that being a housewife is essentially being a slave for your husband. He gives the example of the contrast between historical examples of men sending either slaves to fight in their place when a war happens, so instead of being drafted you send one of your slaves, or you could also just pay someone to fight in the war instead of you. But on the other hand, historically men have gone to absolute astounding lengths in order to keep women safe from war. We're seeing that change in the modern day with women in the military, women being drafted. But the point stands that if the role of mother and housewife was such a disrespected thing, why have men historically gone to such lengths to keep their wives and their mothers and their sisters and daughters safe whenever danger comes around? Now on to the other angle we can hit on for this. That's how much women have been encouraged to go into the corporate world, go into the workforce, and compete with men. Now I don't inherently have a problem with women in the workforce, but I do think it's wrong to neglect family life in favor of that. And I do agree with what the author says about how lately the trend has been for women to harden themselves mentally, which causes a rejection of that feminine role. And it causes people to see raising a family, pregnancy, maternity leave, spending time with young children. It causes people to see that as a hindrance to the career, which the funny thing is the author points it out too. If you spend all your time as a housewife, you're working towards your own personal life, your own family life, but if you spend all the time in the office, that's being more like a slave than anything. You're producing productivity for someone else. Yes, you're getting paid for it, but you're not working on your own life in the process. Unless you really care about that job, at the end of the day, it's just a 9 to 5. And I do believe in that weird theory that children, even infants, can tell whether or not the person who's babysitting them or even the person they're nursing from is their biological mother. I do believe in the conspiracy theory that even babies who developed in a surrogate womb and then were adopted right away at birth by another family who loves them and cares for them, I believe those babies on a subconscious level realize that their biological mother is not there. And I think that does cause some amount of damage. And something else I'll mention here, one of my own thoughts, is the way that women are encouraged to get into the workforce. Men and women are different. We have different strengths, different weaknesses. Women are encouraged to play to their weaknesses rather than living out, acting out something that evolutionarily their sex is just better at than men. I think it's setting people up for mediocrity. It's setting people up for failure and disappointment. I think everyone, both men and women, would be much happier by just giving it a try and trying to pursue those traditional gender roles. The author talks a lot about the sexualization of role models in society, the sexualization of children, the emasculation of men as well, and all these being targeted attacks on the nuclear family and on birth rate. We already looked at the example of music, and yes, those song lyrics are more sexualized, more deviant than would have been tolerated a hundred years ago. But more than the examples the author gave in the last segment, think about a lot of the sexualized songs you hear on the radio, the Whips and Chains song, that one's been really popular lately, but just how much even normies have adopted the idea idea of bondage in the bedroom and kinks and fetishes, which in a loving, married, monogamous relationship, that's completely fine, but we see it talked about everywhere in culture, especially in music. The other thing is how the left has adopted protection of sex workers and the, the rights of sex workers as one of their favorite talking points. But then at the same time, they often attack beauty pageants, just innocent beauty pageants events promoting the non-sexual virtue of a bunch of women or girls and then choosing between them the most attractive one. They say that beauty pageants are objectification, but pornography somehow in their minds is completely fine. The author talks at length about the harms that pornography causes. First off, it promotes the idea that one person isn't enough. I like to go back to, there's like a five or ten second video clip of Sam Hyde being asked by some young guy if it's okay for young men to quote unquote 
quote-unquote sow their wild oats and get it out of their system with prostitutes before finding a wife-quality woman to settle down with and get married. Sam says, no, absolutely not. It doesn't get it out of your system. It gets it into your system. And that really is how the brain works with this stuff. I like to say it's hard to have just one potato chip without plunging your hand back in the bag for more. Objectification and humiliation. More than just what the author says, I see social media posts of porn stars and prostitutes talking about what they do, talking about how lonely it is for them to always be pushed around, always be slapped around, always be fucked but never made love to, never cuddled, never hugged. That's something that women need more than men. Sometimes I do have trouble relating to it, but I see the pain there. I see that a need is not being met, and I see that the violence, even acted out violence, even consensual violence, is very harmful in the absence of those loving interactions. Not only women being treated as objects, but men are made to see women as objects, whether or not they realize it. Men are looking at images and videos online without feeling love for the person they're looking at. It's just pure lust. And there's also the idea that the more the merrier. If you see more people in a video, that's exciting. That's what the author says. I would say it's partially true, not always. But the author talks about also how it promotes unnatural sex acts, violent sex acts. Points out how it is an addiction. It does have an addictive effect on the brain, and that addiction, the nature of addiction, people are always seeking new highs. There's always new fetishes, new extremes. They go more and more and more and more taboo, and it's hard to find a stopping point, even past the point where someone who a few years ago was looking at normal stuff, they might might find themselves looking at illegal stuff, stuff that if they woke up and they took a moment to step back and look at what they were doing, they would be astonished. Because they're viewing, and they're getting a thrill from viewing, an absolute corruption of innocence, a destruction of an unquantifiable sense of beauty. And of course the sexualized role models like the pop stars, we now have porn star celebrities as well. All these things just go to promote this kind of culture. So we've had for thousands of years of humanity a lot of social and biological pressure, and this is in the vocabulary of Darwinism, selective pressure for breeding, pressure towards monogamy. And now we don't necessarily have that anymore. Or perhaps we still do, but it's changing. It's the ratios are shifting. Quote from the book, they, marriage vows, are not a social or religious construct, but reflect a natural urge which religion sought to enshrine in law for the good of society, unquote. I do agree with that, and I believe I already talked about in this video my view of natural law and religion and religious law as being descriptive rather than prescriptive. Humans do have a natural urge to pair bond with only one partner for life, and like I said, these ancient Hebrew books are some of the best ways our ancestors knew for how to make sense of our intelligence and make sense of these natural urges, and they are so good at doing that that we're still reading them thousands of years later. So putting this back in the author's terms, we have an id desire to release our sexual energy in the first place we see, and then on the other hand we have a superego desire to nurture the feeling of love that we have with a marriage partner, to not cause them jealousy or pain by sleeping around with other people. These desires are conflicting for thousands of years of human history. The superego has almost always won out, but lately in the West we're seeing a growing of the id and a shrinking of the superego. And here it gets into talking about the emasculation of men, how Western men are made to be less ideal than what females imagine for their mate. They're feminized, they're fed unhealthy diets, they're encouraged to wear dresses, they're encouraged to do the whole metrosexual thing. Now here's where I might disagree with a lot of my audience. A lot of people say that the left doesn't know how to do trades. I will disagree here. I went to school with these people. I still keep in contact with a lot of them. They do absolutely know how to do trades. They do absolutely use guns. They have AK-47s, they go to the range on the weekend. At the very least, this is in America. They join John Brown gun clubs. Around southeast Pennsylvania, it's the Socialist Rifle Association is the popular one, where they do shooting and literal paramilitary training. I've seen them provide security to pride events in Philadelphia. During the week, they work trade jobs that they are good at. Specialized, semi-skilled labor, sometimes physical labor, and then at night they go home and they put on fursuits and dresses and they post pictures online. So I think it's misleading to underestimate these people's competence in the blue-collar world and underestimate their physical ability. And because of that, I'll say it's not always true that they are becoming emasculated, at least in the way that the author puts it, the way that would make them unattractive to women. I do see some of them getting married, although a lot of them will vocally say that they don't like the direction the world is going and they don't feel right 
bringing a kid into the world under these conditions. These are just the ones I see. Certainly I do believe the stereotypical soy-drinking, Funko Pop collecting, low-T male that is balding in his early 30s. Certainly I do think those do exist out there. I haven't seen very many of them, probably just because of the area that I live in. But on to the point of the book, females don't see those soy-drinking, Funko Pop collecting males as fit in the Darwinian sense. They don't see them as desirable mates. And here's one kicker the author points out, quote, Other cultures who have not abandoned their traditions and ways of life become a false beacon of hope to these lost Western females who seek a strong alpha male that will provide for them and protect their children, unquote. It's hard for me to think of examples either for or against this theory. Maybe in the UK it's a lot more prevalent. But what I will say, though, is I do see millennials on the right wing who are looking to other cultures for lack of their own superego, for lack of feeling strong enough guidance from their fathers and their grandfathers' generation so they feel like they have to go back further to the days of slavery further to the days of Jim Crow and Jew-hating, or maybe they look sideways to Islam, or maybe to Russia. They look to other cultures and other times because they feel a lack of a superego from those in their immediate vicinity who, according to the author, would normally be transmitting this superego. Or not necessarily a lack of superego, but a lack of trust in that superego, specifically because we see how much the world has crumbled around us, and we see how often boomers are blamed for complacency in this. They're portrayed as having sold the future generations down the river, both the right and the left portray boomers like this. They're blamed for accumulating loads of debt that the future generations have to deal with. They're blamed for instituting stupid government policies that are disastrous for future generations, but it really helps their 401k, you know? Now, I don't think this is true for a lot of boomers, in fact, most boomers, but there is a grain of truth to it, and this is how people view things and perception is greater than reality. The author says that father-son rites of passage are being lost. We think of a movie set in the 1950s with a father and a son playing catch outside with a ball, and that's not something I've seen in the modern day in real life. Instead, we see young men spending more and more and more time inside on their computer, on a gaming console, neglecting physical activity and instead playing video games, neglecting friends that they can walk and go see, and instead finding people tailoring carefully their friend group, finding people from any place in the world and only talking online. And yes, gaming does provide that sense of competition, but it doesn't provide that closeness with nature, it doesn't provide that sense of physical activity and exercise, and it doesn't provide the opportunity of seeing your friends face to face. The author says that there is quite a lot that is lost by not seeing friends face to face. That's not something I've put a lot of thought into before reading this book. I would have said that people being allowed to have their primary friend group be people from online, from miles away, from all corners of the world, that allows people more opportunity to build echo chambers and to build little bubbles of people people who only ever affirm what they do, and so they feel more comfortable being weird and unusual and doing degenerate things if that's what they're into, because they're able to build an entire friend group around that activity. But more than that, the author would say there's something missing from not hanging out with just whoever lives nearby. The author is very concerned with the birth rate of the white race. He gives examples from his country, says that breeding rates for whites in the UK are declining, while breeding rates for immigrants in that country are going up and up and up. He says that females control the birth rate because they choose who their sexual partners are and they choose whether or not to keep the baby. So women are the ones that need to wake up and be convinced to be mothers. He talks briefly about abortion, which doesn't contribute to the main point of the book, but I find it interesting. He has a very pragmatic view towards abortion. Again, like I said before, a masculine trait to only look at the utilitarian side of things and ignore the emotional side of these issues. He supports the common exceptions that people say for abortion. If it's a product of rape, if it's a product of incest, if there's a a birth defect, the author says it is okay to have that abortion. But he says that abortion should not be a form of contraception, and he says that in the modern culture it's become a female rejection of natural duty in favor of competition with men. Of course, he already talked about how women in the workplace see pregnancy as a hindrance to their career. My own take on abortion is probably a more Christian take than anything. It is a baby. It is a human life. Is it a product of rape? I don't care. It's a human life. Is it a product of incest? It's a human life. Will it have a birth defect? Will it need care even into its adult years and then die in its 30s? It's 
an enormous burden to deal with, but it's still a human life. And trust me, that's something I myself struggle with because I can also see a future where all humans need C-sections and dental surgery and LASIK eye surgery and some number of organ transplants throughout their life just to live a normal, healthy life, just to live the kind of life that people 50 years ago would have been able to easily expect. But on the other hand, I do see something, some unquantifiable element of beauty and humanity in that one human life, even if it is monstrously deformed. The only abortion I would say is okay is if the mother's life would be put in danger by going through with this birth. Take that to an election and try to win. Ha ha ha. I do think abortion brings with it, or at least it should bring with it, a large amount of guilt, especially on the woman. For that reason, it should be avoided at all costs. That's something you're going to live with for the rest of your life as if you committed a murder. Not only a murder, but a murder of your own child. It's easy to look at it as numbers on a page when we're talking about politics, but that's not the human element to it. That's not the reality on the ground. Women live with these emotional scars for years, maybe for the rest of their life. People debate a lot, oh, when the cutoff should be. First trimester? However many weeks? Heartbeat, maybe? I would say the cutoff doesn't even matter in the face of this kind of guilt. Doesn't matter if it's one month or three months or eight months. If you had not interfered and directly chosen, not in fact elected to get that abortion, there would be one more human life in the world, but you made your choice and there is not. And that's the type of guilt that people need God for. And now there's one more devil's advocate game I want to play. Is pornography and sexualization of children, is that a top-down product of some scheme somewhere, or is that just a product of technology? Is that a bottom-up thing caused by just the way the internet is, the way it developed throughout the 90s and 2000s and 2010s? It's much easier to say it's the latter than the former. For better or worse, the internet is a place where almost anyone can go without giving their ID to any website. I'm sure we know the trope of the kid just clicking into a porn site, oh, blah blah blah, are you over 18? Yes. And that's really how it is. Kids of any age, as long as they're willing to click that yes I'm over 18 button, are able to get in any porn site. And there's a lot of debate to be had about whether that's preferable to the alternative, which is forcing these porn sites to collect government identification from every one of their visitors. Do I want a website having a database of that potentially able to be hacked? Do I want the government to maintain a database of these internet IDs? Do I want the government using that to know which websites I visit, what I post online? I will take an absolutely American Liberty First Amendment answer to that. No, I don't want the government doing that. I don't want any website having that information. The responsibility should be on the parents to know what their children are using computers for. Once more role models come up, and this time focuses on the aspect of the way that they spread degeneracy. So we have the fat acceptance movement, we have drug addiction, we have the party songs that were mentioned before, and I want to hit on a couple more different aspects of the music thing. First up, the difference between the lyrics the role model sings and what the role model actually represents. I saw a meme sort of recently recently from a lefty punk metal circle. The photo on the left was the dude like screaming into the microphone and the caption was metal singers telling you to level the building and the photo on the right was like a cartoon of the most innocent person you can imagine and the caption was metal singers at the merch table after the show. And that's one way to illustrate that some of these bands and the surrounding fans they sing about stuff that's edgy and provocative but not because they want to do those things but just because it's edgy and provocative. Insane Clown Posse, if you've ever heard of them, they're probably the best example of this. I don't know at all how popular they are in the UK, but the American Rust Belt is like their home turf, and their whole thing is they have like the most disgusting, most violent lyrics they can think of, and the whole stage persona is insane serial killer violent clowns. But then you look up videos of them just sitting down and giving interviews or something. They're just chill stoners. Years have passed, the one dude has a daughter now, and he seems like a pretty good father from what I can tell. But they sing about going out and murdering cops, murdering pedophiles, murdering billionaires. The lyrics are provocative and edgy because there's just a market for that edginess. And the other thing I wanted to bring up was media, fiction, and even non-fiction that showcases degenerate behavior as a form of entertainment isn't a new thing. 
And I think there is room for people to enjoy it without feeling the urge to replicate that behavior. Think about popular TV shows, The Sopranos. People don't watch that because they want to be Italian mobsters, they watch it because it's entertainment. Game of Thrones. People don't watch that because they want to become an incestuous psychopath that murders prostitutes. They watch it because it's entertaining. Going into nonfiction, we've probably all seen at least one really trashy reality TV show. Hoarders, we don't idolize those people. We laugh at how trashy their house is. Any number of dating shows. I don't want my love life to be trashy it like that. I watch it because it's entertaining. And someone out there might say that the Jews pushed all of this kind of media on us, but I disagree. And for this example, I will turn to the two giants of classic Russian literature, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Anna Karenina by Lev Tolstoy is a book about cheating spouses. And throughout the whole book, there's not a lot in the way of moral grandstanding. There's not a third party narrator ascribing good or bad to any any of the actions by any of the characters. Instead, we're given an honest, realistic look at the character's thought process. These are some of the most fully fleshed out human characters I've ever read. The book admits that there's human temptation to do these things and just presents it in a way that we're able to observe the whole and judge for ourselves. Dostoevsky also has a lot to say about immorality. I've read Crime and Punishment and I'm in the middle of Brothers Karamazov right now. Dostoevsky's style is more giving you his opinion through the mouths of his characters. The characters will have long, extensive discussions about these things. You get a little bit of action, a little bit of plot advancement, and then for like three chapters they talk about it. They hound on every aspect, spiritual, religious, practical, philosophical. I'm not quite halfway through Brothers Karamazov yet, that's gonna be an interesting one, and honestly I feel a little intimidated by the idea of even doing a book review for that one. But both of those writers, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, are very good, I would recommend them. And bringing it back to the point, they show that we're able to consume these things as a form of media without modeling our life after that. And now back to what Mark says in the book. He says that the degradation of the superego through the media has been going on for decades. He gives the example of the movie Rebel Without a Cause, which I actually have not seen. And he says that the enemies of the West have been boiling the frog by introducing gradually more and more taboo themes into our movies, into our music, into our TV shows. And again, going back to one of my earlier Devil's Advocate games, I won't deny they are trying, but the only reason they're able to maintain the illusion of them having succeeded at that is because there's a market for it, is because we allow them to. But here's a quote from the book, quote, Once the mind is enslaved and has a reduced capacity for reason, then thoughts, ideas, and notions can easily be implanted in the mind regardless of their merit, end quote. Thinking about the lefty people who I know, I would say this quote is largely true. I can see how they gradually come to accept whatever talking points their side favors. And by the way, I also see that to some extent on the right, and really in any echo chamber we look at. If someone is surrounded by arguments in favor of one thing, then over time, with enough self-inflicted propaganda, they're gonna come around to agreeing with that. But but in the case of the left, it's especially harmful because of how destructive their ideas are to society. And it's something that endlessly confuses me because I see people who are, in all other ways, completely competent, functioning human beings. But then if you ask them about Gaza, or trans bathrooms, or abortions, they start foaming at the mouth and launch off on this huge tirade. I don't think that will ever stop puzzling me. Another quote, What could be a more ideal form of slavery than one which does not require chains, guards, or constant supervision, but instead the slave is kept in place by his own subservient mental state? But what would make that devious trick even more impressive is if the slave didn't even realize he was a slave and instead thought himself to be free. Unquote. Now that reminded me of a common saying that you'll hear going around Christian circles, indulgence is slavery and self-discipline is the true freedom. Now that's one that it took me a little while to come around to, to understand the truth of, to have it sink in for me. But for the time it took me to see that, it sunk in all the more. Addiction is indeed slavery. If you cannot stop yourself from doing something, if you just can't help it, then how can you claim to not be a slave to it? Whatever it is, drugs, porn, junk food, and on the flip side, self-discipline is freedom. It might sound like self-imposed slavery, but it's the freedom to say no. It's the freedom to choose for yourself rather than being led around like a dog on a leash by your id, by your baser impulses. And I wrote down that quote because it really reminded me of that concept, that view of slavery and freedom. And that's actually a good transition for another point I want to make 
make because I mentioned Brothers Karamazov. That also talks about the concept of slavery to your baser impulses and literally uses the term slavery for that. It wasn't the first time I read it, but it is also in that book, spoken by a character who is a monk in a monastery, and framing it in terms of Christianity versus paganism or atheism. I'd like to present the question of whether or not the domination of the id is a new problem for humanity, whether it's a new and unique thing that so many people are following their id and choosing to reject the superego. There are a lot of historical examples and a lot of biblical examples that would say, no, this is not a new problem. And me, myself, I would say that Christianity is the greatest tool for exercising and building self-discipline that humanity has ever known. And without it, a whole lot more people, a whole lot more people would be dead by suicide or written off for useless or exiled or lost souls people who have given up on themselves. Christianity is the religion for those people who would otherwise be nothing. It is the religion for beggars and prostitutes. It's the religion for the poor, for the downtrodden. Look at the Beatitudes. Blessed are they who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This is the religion of turning around broken people and reshaping entire lives. Reshaping these people to be productive members of society. But not only them, it's the religion that can help every single person and conquering their addictions, conquering the id, conquering their baser impulses. And by contrast, we can think about the various pagan groups that the Jews encountered after they came into the Promised Land. The people around them worshipped wooden idols, like they carved images of what their gods would look like out of wood, and they sat that on a table and they worshipped that. And not just worship human sacrifice, child sacrifice. They had sex gods, fertility gods, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament too. In some of the Greek and Roman cities that were addressed in the epistles. These cities were places of hedonism and sex and debauchery, places with temple priestesses who were really just glorified free-use sex slaves, and Christianity says no to all that. Christianity says we will not just bow down to our baser impulses, we will purify not only our actions but our minds, our thoughts, our entire souls, our entire beings. We will get that trash out of every part of our lives, even our personal most inmost thoughts. And we see this battle between this is where framing this in Freudian language is actually pretty useful. The battle between the id and the superego going on over the course of centuries, millennia, multiple thousands of years. I don't think it's a new problem for humanity by any means, and I don't think we need a new answer because we already have an answer. The book gets into a section about physical fitness, and the core point of this section here is strong and healthy people build and maintain civilizations while weak people do nothing. And doing nothing is in fact worse than just the absence of progress alone. Doing nothing is apathy in the face of entropy, in the face of the inevitable decline of all things unless they're maintained. I was just watching this week, Tucker Carlson did an interview with Naye Bukele, who's the president of El Salvador, the guy that put all the gang members in jail, crippled MS-13 in the country, completely turned the crime rate around. I do recommend that interview. The guy gives all the credit to God in a beautiful way, but more to the point, he talks about a dam that one of the people underneath him was building in order to protect a particular neighborhood from, I forget if it was a flood or a mountain collapse or something to that effect. And the way he tells it, Michele was initially against building that dam because he said, sooner or later, a couple years down the road, we're going to get out of office and then the thing is going to collapse. And he didn't see it as a permanent fix to the problem. But the advisor told him, if it's maintained, it will stay strong. Everything stays strong if it gets maintained. But if it's not maintained, no matter what it is, it's going to collapse sooner rather than later. And that is true. Cars, roads, national infrastructure, they gave an example of a stretch of railroad in California that was embarrassingly short, embarrassingly expensive, and took an embarrassing amount of time to build. And even in the book reviews I've done so far, The Art of the Deal, do you remember the Woolman Rink story? Government does not know what it's doing with these construction projects. You need to hire the right people for the job, and you need to look to people who know how to get it done, and put people in charge who are gonna make sure it gets done. But in order to be the type of person who gets stuff done in that way, you need both mental and physical physical strength. The one often comes with the other. I go back to the Fight Club book review that I did a lot. The quote from that book, after a few months of Fight Club, you trust yourself to handle anything. And yes, I've been doing martial arts, and quite honestly, I don't feel the need to carry a firearm every day, because after enough time of doing that, I do trust myself to handle a lot more situations. A concealed carry handgun is just a tool. If someone
someone knows how to use it, they're going to be deadly. If someone is not mentally and physically strong, it's going to be a joke. I feel confident in my daily life. I feel confident in my own ability to deal with threats of physical violence if I ever saw one. If everyone in society were to train physically in order to get that confidence, there would be a lot less crime in the world. Now, the author says that physical health is under attack. He says that the enemies of the West want to make us infirm and debilitated. Gives the example of the fat acceptance movement. What I see in the fat acceptance movement is a hardening of the heart, and I'll compare that a lot to the story of Exodus, Pharaoh's heart getting hardened. If you've watched Jordan Peterson's roundtable discussion of that book, you will know what I mean. It's people in denial that they have a vice that needs to be dealt with. They're in denial because it's hard to fix and it's easier to ignore it. Now, I will play the devil's advocate game here again. Is the fat acceptance movement orchestrated top-down or is it bottom-up? I think it is bottom-up. I think it's the result of people who don't want to admit they have a vice for the same reason that people in ancient times denied Jesus Christ for telling them the truth, for the same reason that they denied and threatened all the major prophets of the Old Testament. Now, you've heard me say a lot so far in this book review, echoing Solzhenitsyn, nobody did it to us, we did it to ourselves, and we allowed it to be done to ourselves. I see that as an important distinction because it puts the power and the responsibility on us to turn it around. We do have the ability to turn it around. But I bring that up specifically because I will say in America, there's one more added facet to the problem that for the longest time most people were not even aware of, and it's something that most other countries in the entire world do not have to contend with, that is high fructose corn syrup. America grows a lot of corn, and it's subsidized by the government. That subsidy is propping up a lot of jobs that would otherwise collapse our agriculture if we didn't have it. So there's a fair political argument in favor of keeping it. Much in the same way, if you watch my Pennsylvania elections video, that Democrats are able to use those school taxes as a cudgel against people who want to eliminate the property tax. So it's there, it's entrenched in the unthinkable amount of red tape and bureaucracy of government, and the result of it is our country has a lot of cheap corn, and when life gives these corporations lemons, they make lemonade. When they give them a cheap source of quote-unquote nutrition. They grind it into high fructose corn syrup, which is essentially just a syrupy sweet sludge that they put into almost every food. If you look at the ingredients list on an, almost any soda can, in America it will say high fructose corn syrup on almost every can with the exception of the glass bottles. The glass bottles in America use pure cane sugar and all the sodas in all the other countries use pure cane sugar. America sweetens our soft drinks with high fructose corn syrup. Not only that, it's in ice cream, it's in ketchup. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think McDonald's actually finds a way to pack it into the burger buns. A lot of the frozen dinners, it's hard to avoid because it's in so much food. You need to buy just fruit or vegetables or meat that's not frozen or ground up. It's hard to avoid because it is everywhere. I've managed to avoid it to a large extent. I've cut a lot of it out of my diet, and after a few months off of it, actually, I did start to be able to taste it. After a while, drinking water, tea, coffee instead of soda. Once in a blue moon, go back, drink a soda again. And the consistency is not how I remember it. I can only compare it to the feeling of having motor oil sludge and drip down your throat. Foreigners, the people who have real soda, real ketchup, real barbecue sauce, you don't know how how lucky you are not to have the corn syrup ketchup. I've actually been lucky enough to be out of the country and be able to taste real barbecue sauce that's not just like the syrupy, slimy paste, just actual liquid condiment instead of this sludge that we have. And it's not as if sugar is good either, don't get me wrong, but look at the obesity rates in America. I think it's fair to say that sugar is at least better than high fructose corn syrup. So now that that rants out of the way and hopefully you'll pay attention more to the ingredients in your food that you buy. Going back to the fat acceptance movement, I think it is people who don't want to admit to themselves that they're not eating right, they're not exercising. And the corporations that buy into it, I don't think it's a top-down thing. I think they're responding to market demand. Look back to the 90s and 2000s. We didn't see this. We didn't see plus-size models. We didn't see plus-size Miss Alabama. We didn't see giant photos on the wall on the inside of Target with just the fattest, ugliest people they can find modeling underwear in the underwear section. What we saw in the 90s and 2000s is the photoshopped, unrealistic beauty 
beauty standards that the second wave feminists love to complain about, the models with anorexia, the models whose photos were digitally altered to make them look skinnier. That's what our marketing looked like back in the era when sex sells. But now we're in the era where the participation trophy generation doesn't want the fat person to feel self-conscious even though, in the privacy of our own minds, we all know she's fat and ugly. It's just no one wants to say it because no one wants to hurt her feelings. And those people, millions of them, are the ones who corporations advertise to. They're the ones who shop at Target, they're the ones who buy all the perfumes and all the women's underwear. That market demand is what gave us the top-down component of the fat acceptance movement. I don't believe that this was planned out or orchestrated by any sort of higher power. The book gets into a chapter about the soul, and the author lays it out in what I think is a simple but effective way. He says that the soul is real, family and community bonds of love are necessary food for the soul, to keep the soul at peace. Nature is also a necessary food for the soul, and spending all your time inside on the computer playing video games, even if you're doing it on voice chat with friends, that alone isn't going to be enough fulfillment for the soul. And the author says that depression is the result of a soul that is not spiritually fulfilled. I'll give a couple quotes here, quote, Religion has sought to remove the fear of death and give people faith that there is more to life than simply survival, unquote. I wouldn't say that's all there is to religion, there's certainly a lot more, but that is a core component. And being without religion in light of this sounds like a frightening existence. And another quote from this chapter, quote, The purpose of this is not to examine different religions in detail or to say which religion is right, or in fact which religion is wrong, but simply to state that religion has always played a central part in feeding the soul and providing spiritual nourishment for Western man. So again, that's a very simple but effective view of it. And in my own study of various religions, I found that there is a lot of truth to a lot of them. I come back to Jesus Christ because that's the one that has more spiritual truth I've found to it than anything else I've ever looked at. You can look at Shintoism, Taoism, Buddhism, Islam, Paganism, Zoroastrianism. There's elements of truth to all these, but I found that the Gospels have such a complete truth that I have not seen anywhere else. But back to the book. The conclusion here, quote, Western man needs to rediscover what makes him whole, the things that spiritually feed him, and complete his soul, allowing him to be at ease with himself and his surroundings." Unquote. And that reminds me of the meme that I think almost all of us have seen, about a Roman politician named Diocletian who was retired and he was asked to come back and serve Rome again, and he gave the response, if you could come here and see the cabbages I have grown with my own hands, then you would not ask such a thing of me. Aren't we all just trying to grow cabbages? Now the author does a transition here, and I'll give the direct quote, the enemies of the West have something else up their sleeves. Whenever they create a vacuum, by removing a positive, they always seek to fill that vacuum with something unnatural and unhealthy that only serves to further enslave Western man." Unquote. And the author proposes that materialism is the thing that's replaced true spirituality in our society. I think it definitely is true that people use secular therapy and retail therapy at times when they should be looking to God. I'll spare you from playing the devil's advocate game one more time, because I think I beat that horse too many times. I will look back once again, though, to my Fight Club book review, because that's exactly what that book was about about the spiritual emptiness that comes from worshipping at the altar of consumerism. Rather than having family units that are complete, personal lives that are fulfilling, and relationships with God that are edifying and guiding. And something else I want to bring up, I remember earlier in this review talking about what the author said about rejecting both capitalism and communism. I do definitely see the point of this type of corporatism that needs to be rejected. Because at the end of the day, the corporations do want to make a profit, whether or not the people buying their products have empty souls. It certainly is more useful to them if they market their products as cures for depression. I mentioned that we're probably not working off the same definition of capitalism. I'm used to thinking of the ad-filled dystopia that we live in as a result of corporatism, monopolies, trusts, whatever you want to call it, but I don't think capitalism necessarily requires huge monopolistic corporations dominating everything and forcing advertisements down our throat every minute of the day. Another point I want to hit on, though, is the author does say the materialism has become our new god, and he does use the vocabulary of worshipping at the temple of materialism. Christians, evangelicals in the audience, you know where I'm going with this. The word idol in the modern sense, as opposed to in the Old Testament sense, back
back then when they literally worshipped all these different gods and stone carved images that represented their gods as opposed to today. If you go to a Christian circle where they're giving a presentation on financial responsibility, you'll hear them talk about what our bank account says about where our priorities lie. Both our time and our money are good indicators of what we value in life. A quote from Matthew 6, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. There's this very common idea that idols in the modern world are not false gods, necessarily. Idols are things that we value above the true God. So we have to examine where our priorities are, because you remember the story about Jesus telling the rich man to sell off everything he has and give it to the poor. It wasn't necessarily about the money, it's about his attachment to the money. It's about his inability to serve two masters because he already has one master. If we want a better spiritual life, we have to think of everything we do as a form of worship, either worshiping God or worshiping something else. And if we're worshiping something else, we have to really think about where our priorities are and where we want them to be. If we're valuing money, a promotion, a job, above family, where is that going to lead us five or ten years down the road? If we're valuing sex above love, where is that going to lead us five or ten years down the road. If we're valuing comfort above serving others, where is that going to lead us five or ten years down the road? So it is good practice to think about these things as idols, as man-made things that humans worship, things that we have to be willing to set aside in service to the one true God, the God that will set our lives in the right direction, the God that will take even the most broken people and allow them to fix their lives to an astonishing degree that nobody around them ever would have thought possible. But back to materialism specifically, Quote from the book, A man can purchase an expensive luxury car and surely derive pleasure from driving it, but if the journey he makes is lonely and he is headed to a place where he is neither loved nor wanted, then surely he could be happier to walk barefoot in the rain to a warm home full of people he loved and who eagerly anticipated his arrival. Unquote. And I wrote that quote down because I think it is a pretty beautiful string of words to illustrate this spiritual importance that we could either place on material things or on love and family, and community as well. And another thing the book gets into is the concept that materialism tells people having children is too expensive. I'm sure we've all talked to someone, there's a lot of people out there who don't believe they're financially stable enough to have children. And so they put it off, they put it off, or they just might not ever intend to have children. We see people out there who celebrate the fact that they live the dual-income, no-kids, D-I-N-K lifestyle, worshipping at the false idol of money instead of family. But I've also talked to a lot of parents who say that it's the most rewarding thing in the world, and say that when it's time to make room in the budget for a kid, it falls into place when the time comes. I don't have kids yet, I definitely plan to, and I do believe those parents when they say that. The author has a chapter on the breaking of the Western heart, and Western heart is something that I at least find it a little hard to define in any other way than giving examples of it. And giving examples is what the author does. He identifies attacks on national heroes, role models, people who posthumously transmit the superego to future generations. We've already talked about the institutions that are now mocked instead of revered, the breaking of respect for those, and it's a similar thing in regards to national heroes. Some things that the author mentions are the Battle of Thermopylae, the Battle of Vienna, and the Battle of Works Drift. Things that stick in the mind as examples of Western man coming together in an impressive way against a foe who honestly hates our culture. But instead of looking up to these people in the modern day, we are taught to feel ashamed of them. The three big things he hits on are colonization, the Holocaust, and the Atlantic slave trade. Things that the enemies of the West hit on again and again and again in an attempt to break down our national loyalty. Not loyalty might not be the best word for that, but our national pride. We're meant to lose pride in people like Thomas Jefferson. People who made our country's what they are, and the propaganda in the media likes to hit on the idea that we today need to rectify these wrongs that were committed hundreds of years ago. So Indian rights, reparations to blacks, and of course dare I mention anything involving Israel. And what it boils down to is people alive today are being charged with crimes committed so long ago that nobody alive today can remember it. And something the author brings up I wanted to make sure to mention. All cultures, every place, 
at some point in history there was slavery there. Western cultures, America, Britain, other places in Europe, Western cultures are the ones that ended slavery, the ones that had huge pushes to prohibit this. But the result of this decline of the Western heart is the author identifies a lot of timidity, a lot of people in the West being pushed around and told that if we say a single word against it, we're racist. And this fear of being called racist, maybe not so much in the 2020s, but certainly in the 2000s and the 90s, being labeled a racist was one of the worst things that could happen. If everybody thinks you hate a certain group just because of their skin tone, that could lose you your job, you could become a social outcast. And the starkest example of this that the author brings up is the, the public response to the Rotherham grooming gang. Rotherham being a place in England where a lot of immigrants from a certain culture, they came in and groups of young men from among this demographic formed gangs that would essentially sexually assault white women at will, often young white girls, and nobody stopped them. The police didn't even look into it because they didn't want to be labeled racist. They didn't want it to be a huge controversy for that police department. And the author gives a particularly moving quote about this, quote, grown men chose to watch in silence as their daughters were taken away to be sexually abused rather than run the risk of being called racist for speaking out or fighting back and defending their loved ones. Make no mistake, the most sickening aspect of the scandal in Rotherham was that no one stood up to what was happening, end quote. And that's one that even gave me pause because it is such a stark example of people in the West doing absolutely nothing in the face of the worst humiliation, the worst kind of oppression that one group can place on another short of taking away their human rights. In the face of that, it is hard to argue that Western man has not lost our heart, but I will take the case up. I'll start with national heroes, national pride, national icons, and I don't know if this is any different in Britain from America. I could speculate that it might be, because Britain on the one hand did a lot of colonization. Even my own country once upon a time was a colony of Britain. Britain has places on the map half the globe around, both eating up and regurgitating propaganda, speaking ill of their nation and their history because of all that colonialism. America on the other hand, I can't be 100% sure of this, but being on my side of the pond and looking at their side of the pond, trying to compare the two based on mostly just stuff I see online, I would say America does still have a lot of love for our history and for our national heroes. The story of Valley Forge, the story of Washington crossing the Delaware on Christmas to slaughter Brits. That's a story that maybe not every American knows and loves, but it's common, and a lot of people at least feel some sort of pride when they hear it. Or at the very least, if they don't feel proud about it, they make jokes about it. <laughs> our first president, our general, he's gonna kill you on Christmas. Lexington and Concord. If you love guns, you love the story of an entire line of British regulars marching up to try and confiscate guns from a small rural town, failing to do so, and then getting harassed and shot at all the way back to Boston. Love it. The Tea Party. That is an iconic piece of American history. Flash forward. World War II. Battle of the Bulge. Again, maybe not something every American knows, but if you look into it, a group of American soldiers held their position in the face of a German advance, to the point where if you look at the battle map from a bird's eye view, there is a bulge in the line where the Americans stood their ground and the people around them retreated in the face of the Germans. So they were there isolated for a while. In the middle of winter, they were freezing, starving. The German commander writes to them, says, hey, uh, if you want to surrender, you'll be treated fairly. Do you want to talk about terms or something? The American sends back one word, one word only, nuts. That is a very American response. I love it. And then shall we mention Texas? The war for independence from Mexico, the Battle of the Alamo, come and take it. They have pride, a lot of pride, and a lot of small towns across the country, all across the country, middle America, flyover states, they have pride in their local history, even a lot of the big cities have pride in their local history. And I even see the far lefties at selective moments, whenever they see something that can even remotely be portrayed as a North versus South thing, they will go full gung-ho Yankee Doodle, praise Lincoln, praise Grant, absolutely praise John Brown. They love the Union, even if they don't like America. Now, apart from things that are national stories that are told to future generations, I will argue that people in the West, or at the very least people in America, have not lost our heart. We have not lost our will to fight. Sometimes literally fighting in the street. Do you remember 2017, the Battles of Berkeley, where people on the right kept having over and over and over again, free speech rally, free speech rally, free speech rally, and then Antifa kept coming over and over and over again, trying to shut it down, punch a Nazi, hate speech is not free speech. I was in college watching 
that happened. Do you remember Based Stickman? What about the BLM riots and their consequences? Do you remember Kyle Rittenhouse? What about people who are being oppressed by the Fed? How often do we hear the stories of Waco and Ruby Ridge come up? But more than that, can you imagine the nuts on one Mr. James O'Keefe, guy who does undercover journalism work interviewing people who work in the Department of Defense? Even the author of this book has had run-ins with the law related to him speaking his own political views. Even the 45th president of the United States has been arrested, his mugshot is online, and mwah, chef's kiss, it's a beautiful one. The American people, I would say the people in the West in general, and even the American leftists have not lost their heart. This is going to be something that a right-wing audience is probably going to fiercely disagree with, but I was in college in 2016. I went to high school with these people. I still talk to a good number of them. I like to think I understand what makes them tick politically. Their reaction to the spreading dislike of the gays, for example, or perceived dislike of blacks, or Hispanics, immigration, or anti-Semitism. Their reaction to those things is the same as our reaction to Drag Queen Story Hour aimed at kids. They see a world that has gone crazy. They are surprised that absolutely everyone is in all up in arms, talking about the parallels between the Nazis and the modern right. They think we have lost our minds because we grew up hearing about Nazi Germany and how that kind of hatred and nationalism can lead to genocide, millions of people dying. And they take it as common sense that we just shouldn't be quick to hate an entire group of people based on, here's the important part, something that they cannot control. So that would be race, in a lot of cases religion, they believe that sexual preference is something that people can't control, and here's the crux, they believe political views are something that people can control. So that's where they get away in their own minds with making broad generalizations about the right, saying that large groups of people should burn in a pit of cobras essentially. Condemning large groups of people at once, hope they die, good riddance, celebrating when police get shot, that's where they get away with that because they see those things as things that someone is choosing to be hateful. And so, naturally, they celebrate when hateful people are no longer in this world. That is their political ideology as they see it. I don't agree with it, but let's explore it from their terms. Antifa, 2017, they are going out and putting up visible, physical resistance to people who essentially just want to say the n-word. If we go back a few decades, Black Panthers, blacks in America saw themselves as a so they started becoming gun owners and policing their own communities, uh, based. Remember the guy a couple months back who self-immolated? He went in front of the Jewish embassy, covered himself in gasoline while wearing a military uniform, and lit himself on fire. And the reason he did that was protesting for Gaza. Yeah, okay, that is a crazy reason to do it, but how many of us for absolutely anything in the world would do that to ourselves? Crazy, yes, but courageous, also yes. And then look at John Brown gun clubs. These are groups of left-wing people who love John Brown, the guy who did the Harper's Ferry attack, the guy who tried to kick off the Civil War a year early by starting a massive slave rebellion, that guy. They idolize this guy, and they train with weapons, and there's a lot of lefty ideology mixed in. In my own part of Pennsylvania, a popular group that does this is the SRA, Socialist Rifle Association. It's a play on words for the NRA. I know people who are in these groups. They train, they do security for pride events. They are ready to bear arms and defend what they believe in if needed. And I think that is spiritful. And finally, another point I want to bring up is, in 2016, we joke about the meme war, but I, I'm sorry for bringing it back to Fight Club again, that one quote, our great war is a spiritual war, our great depression is our lives. My age group was not given such an obvious foreign enemy as the people who we were told knocked down the Twin Towers. My age group was not given a physical war to fight. My age group is not called to defend the Constitution from enemies foreign. My age group is called to defend the Constitution from domestic enemies. We don't have to get into a physical fight to do that. In fact, it's better if we don't. But I see a lot of people on the ground, I'm involved with people who do this, and there's a good amount of people who I think, if they needed to fight, could and would. A lot of boomers and Gen Xers, yes, but also the Zoomers are sort of getting into it. It skips a generation a little bit. Millennials we're the weird ones, but the kids, the kids are alright. There is a chapter on the cult of individualism, and I found this one really interesting. It's not an idea that I see talked about in much any other place. The overarching idea is that Western man's strength is in his ability to community organize, and that individualism has been injected into the culture by the enemies of the West. That part's true enough. He talks about tattoos, piercings, body modifications being symptoms of individualism, being ways that people try to make themselves stand out, try to be unique, try to be different from everyone around them. I'm with him so far, and here's a quote. The West was at its strongest when its community was the most cohesive. 
and the enemies of the West know this." Unquote. True enough, and by the way, a church is the best place you can go if you want a community organized. I've seen people try to reinvent the wheel here and try to make artificial right-wing groups whose goal is to share skills, share gardening surplus. And these are secular groups based around the ideology of the right wing, but what they're missing is we already have that. It's called a church. It's called going to your local church. It's called meeting people who are brought together by the self-improvement ideology of religion, of Jesus Christ. And through those community links, sharing skills and garden surplus naturally comes up. The chapter talks about people choosing solitary pursuits, so internet, TV, social media, games, rather than interacting with their neighbors, and obviously that is a roadblock to community organizing. Somehow I don't think that technology is going away though, so we have to adapt how society interacts with it, or just accept the proportion of people who are going to be addicted to those things and spend hundreds, maybe thousands of hours doing that. Not that I'm not guilty too, I've, uh, I'm a little embarrassed of my playtime for AoE 2, Crusader Kings 2, Mountain Blade Warband, you know, all the good stuff. But here's the part of this chapter I've really found interesting and I really want to dig into, subcultures. The author identifies subcultures as ways to break up the local community, and the example he explores quite heavily are bands. Different groups of fans for different music groups, different music genres. He talks about how the various subgenres of heavy metal apparently all have conflicts with each other. I haven't personally dug down deep to get to know who's who and what's what in that scene. Talks about how these groups very often have common ways of dressing. Maybe a symbol, maybe a color, maybe a certain piercing or a certain t-shirt logo or a certain tattoo, a certain way to do makeup, something like that. Ways that you can identify a fan of this niche subgenre of music just by looking at them, and ways for fans to identify each other. The author identifies this as an obstacle to local community organizing, and he compares all the colorful dress to ways that an infant tries to cry out, tries to get attention. The author says that when children have the superego imparted into them, part of that means realizing you have to find other ways to get your needs met than just crying for mom every day. But the author draws the comparison between children who don't have that superego imparted and adults who seem to have grown up without ever having that lesson learned. And so the way they cry out is to dress provocatively, act provocatively, try to shock people into giving them attention. And apart from being immature and attention-seeking, the author says that these groups demanding so much loyalty take something away from loyalty to your culture. Quote, a greater problem lies in the task of putting these pieces back together, as the process of fixing this mess is made all the more difficult as the pieces that once made up Western society are now so different they no longer fit together as they should." End quote. Now, I'm gonna respond to this by playing the song Footloose on this video, actually. I I'm not gonna do that, just kidding. I'm gonna respond to it by telling a story. I switch schools after my freshman year of high school, so 10th grade I was coming into a new school. Didn't really know anyone too well. When school started that semester there was a period of trying to figure out who I could talk to, who I could hang out with, and the easiest to hang out with group of people that I met were juggalos. They were people who listened to ICP and Avenged Sevenfold, smoked pot on the weekends, dressed like scene kids with the black colorful hair, they had the Invader Zim backpack patches, My Chemical Romance, Bullet for My Valentine, we got food thrown at us in the lunchroom, I know a guy who punched out out one of the windows to the school cafeteria and got a bunch of glass in his hand. I know a chick who smuggled a water bottle full of vodka into school on the day of an AP exam. Yeah, she actually took an AP class, made it all the way to the exam, and then decided to day drink in school all day on the day of the test. What a world. But those are the people I hung out with in high school and I don't know, I think I turned out alright. I keep in loose touch with a lot of them, I think a lot of them turned out alright. Maybe at times it does feel a little bit like the Offspring song, The Kids Aren't Alright, How Can This One Little Street Swallow So Many Lives? But I think, for the most part, we turned out okay. We grew up, we grew out of the edginess, a lot of these people are living normal, unassuming, middle-class, working-class lives. And like I said, I still do listen to some of that music. And like I said in the earlier part of this video, the point of the music is to be edgy, the point of the music is to get uptight people who forgot what it's like to be kids, get those people up in arms. Have you gone over the lyrics of Little Piece of Heaven by Avenged Sevenfold? Oh, that's a spicy one. To Catch a Predator by ICP? Oh, man. But that stuff didn't turn us into psychopathic serial killers, and it didn't make us want 
want to go out and march on the streets and find fans of a rival music genre and beat them up. I didn't see any of that. Where I do see it, actually more so in the UK than in the US, are sports fans. I've heard some pretty crazy stories about UK sports stadiums, the soccer, football, whatever you want to call it, fans. Stories about those people going out and beating each other up. They have uniforms, they have chants that are unified. I think those people actually fit the description that the author gives of subcultures more than a lot of music groups do. And I don't see anyone saying that being a fan of the Eagles, or being a fan of whatever soccer team is popular over there, I don't see people saying that takes away from national unity or takes away from patriotism. And I don't think having a juggalo phase in high school and being patriotic are mutually exclusive. Unless, of course, the subculture is political and takes itself way too seriously. I can think of some of the things on the left. Drag queen culture. Philadelphia actually has a pretty hefty burlesque culture, believe it or not. Online groups centered around certain kinks, certain sexual fetishes. And then, of course, transsexualism. I would call that a subculture. Those things, because they are very often hyper-dominated by Marxists, a lot of those groups, I would say, are antithetical to patriotism. But I don't think attacking rockabillies or juggalos or whatever group of fans for some niche musical genre, I don't think that's going to get us anywhere. But piggybacking off the previous chapter in an impressive way is a chapter on the death of the Western superego. And the main point of this chapter is something that's sort of echoed from the previous chapter. The enemies of the West seek to destroy the Western superego, which is a set of values, traditions, and genetics passed down through the generations. Quote, when a nation works together as a cohesive group, the nation advances and has a far greater chance of warding off threats. Unquote. And another quote, the death of the Western superego is not just the death of the Western community, and it is not just the death of Western nations. The death of the Western superego is the death of the very spirit that made possible the great achievements that have defined the West and shaped the development of the whole world. Unquote. So the author sees, and I would agree here, the death of something inquantifiable. The death of an entire culture, an entire lifestyle, an entire way of thinking, an entire set of attitudes about the world, about history, about science and knowledge, and even about spiritual things. He sees a demographic replacement of white Europeans in almost all Western nations, if not all, and he equates that with the end of this entire way of thinking. The mass importation of these different races and different cultures into the West, and the differential breeding rates, it seems like they are going to outbreed us. Us being people of purely European stock. And yes, there is absolutely a thing of beauty being extinguished here. Not that I think the American identity is or should be based around race, but I do think there's something irreplaceable that we will lose if people of European stock worldwide were to effectively be brought to zero. Quote, the conditions for a perfect storm are now in place, and in that storm the West will be washed away and consigned to the history books, if indeed history books are ever written again in the absence of Western man, unquote. Talks about how our society has changed and become less cohesive. People don't know their neighbors like they did decades ago. Well, in a lot of places in America they do, a lot of small towns, I'm sure a lot of small towns in England as well, but I do recognize that the proportion of people who actually do know their neighbors has shrunk. I know my neighbors, not everyone in a suburb does, certainly not everyone in a city apartment building does. And then the author gets into a little section about something that's fun to talk about even though, at least speaking for myself, whenever I see this type of discussion, I know it's not going to go anywhere, I don't take it fully seriously, but still it's fun to delve into. Something you'll see in far-right echo chambers, the idea of either a hypothetical race war or or a hypothetical ideological war, a civil war in America, the big igloo, so to speak, the ultimate showdown between Antifa and right-wing people. Quote from the book, Some may mock this assertion and claim that when the time comes, Western man will wake up and do what is necessary. However, those believing that years of media brainwashing will be undone in a single moment are simply delusional, unquote. The author firmly believes that white man will not be able to unify if we're ever faced with such a hypothetical war. Another quote, Do not underestimate the ability of the word racist to disarm Western man, do not underestimate the effect that the prolonged message of white guilt and self-hate have had on the mind of Western man, unquote. Still somewhat true, however less true than it was in 2016 or 2015, certainly 2012. This book was published in 2016. Now, as long as we're going down autistic tangents, honestly, I don't mind, I do find it fun. I will point out, first of all, my belief that I have stated before, Hispanics will assimilate. In a hundred years, I don't think anyone's going to be able to tell a Hispanic apart from a non-Hispanic 
Hispanic by listening to their voice alone or by looking at their house alone. Maybe by looking at them, although not in every case. Another thing I will point out, Amish and Mormons. The UK doesn't have these as much. But I remember from around 2016 time seeing, some of you might remember too, that gif of it's a map of America and it's colored in with population density specifically of Amish and Mormon populations over time and you see just this massive expanding blob from Utah taking over the entire Midwest and then this massive expanding blob from Pennsylvania taking over the entire East. I live in Pennsylvania, I do see that happening. I do see Amish communities expanding. They do community organize in more ways than even we would think possible. They pull money for health insurance, they pull money for buying land, they buy up neighborhoods and essentially gentrify them. In the past couple years, there have been two new horse and buggy homes near me. One of them is just at the end of my street, the other one is just two miles away from that. So it's coming to me. My morning commute is going to be filled with horse and buggies sooner than later. Because of the way that they pull money for land buying, they turn up to these home auctions and they buy with cash an entire property with farmable land that they plan to do agriculture on. Horrible for traffic, horrible for home prices, horrible for anyone who wants to buy a new home in the area, but I won't complain about the organic food. And then, uh, if these population numbers are to be believed, seeing the Mormons out west doing the same thing, yeah, at least in America, I don't think whites are going anywhere. And even just evangelical Protestants in general, my church is currently having a baby boom. In the past, like, three years, we've had, man, it must be, like, at least ten babies. I lose track of them. Honestly, it's great, though. It's great seeing the kids run around. But that's a white pill for those who might appreciate it. The chapter wraps up, quote, Western man's true salvation lies in reclaiming what made him great and rediscovering the Western superego and resurrecting it in its true form, unquote. I plan to do some book reviews of key American superego, as we may call it, pieces of writing on this channel, so stay tuned for that. If I can, I'm gonna try to get collaborations for some of that, too. I have specific people and books in mind that I want to do. But on to the next chapter. The author spends a few of the following chapters actually going over different ideologies that provide false hope to people in the West who recognize at least part of the problem and want to do something about it, but the author sees these as false lights at the end of the tunnel, false hope, leading ultimately to some kind of dead end. The first chapter he does is conservatism. Quote, to move forward, Western man must walk down the correct path, not the path laid out by his enemies that will lead him to dead ends and eventual extinction, unquote. Here's another place we could play that devil's advocate game. I will let you do that on your own. I think my listeners are pretty smart. Now, how does the author define conservatism? Quote, conservatism is not an ideology of advancement or of progress, but merely one that is obsessed with clinging to and protecting the current status quo, unquote. Another quote, conservatism is not concerned with advance, attack, or counterattack. Conservatism is simply concerned with the defense of a fixed position, unquote. I wouldn't necessarily have defined conservatism that way, although I do see his point. Maybe a synonym of this definition in the American context, although not an exact match for that word, might be rhinos, neocons. I would say people in the MAGA movement consider themselves conservative and consider the rhinos to be fake conservative sellouts. But for the sake of the book, I, I know what he's trying to say, and I'll go along with his definition for the sake of this discussion. Quote, due to the nature of conservatism as an almost purely defensive strategy, it is doomed to failure, unquote. And I'm using so many direct quotes from the book for this part because I think the author's words describe what he's trying to say better than I could. Quote, the conservative sees the battle at hand and fights for the defense of what he or she sees as right and true, but does not see the larger picture of the war that surrounds the battle, unquote. For example, did you know, well, you might have known, but did you think about lately that seatbelts in cars, they never used to be mandatory, and there was actually a big fight against them being made mandatory. We ultimately gave the government permission to come in and make rules about something as trivial as a little shoulder strap that goes in your car and a belt strap that's meant to hold you in your seat in the event of an accident. Income tax. There are people, well, very few people. You might have to go to the legit libertarian party in order to find these people, but there are people today who would still oppose the income tax. But at the time when it was first made, oh, that was a big thing. FDIC, that's an FDR thing. The idea that the government itself insures your bank account, so if the bank ever goes belly up, you're guaranteed at least 10000 or the amount that was in your bank account up to 10000 That's what FDIC does. Who gave the government permission to do that? Oh yeah, our socialist president. And today, that's something that nobody thinks about, nobody talks about. So I definitely see the author's point. There are battles from both the distant and intermediate past that have been completely forgotten, not talked about at all. And that's not even mentioning the most popular thing that people point out, the slow march of gay rights. I'm sure if you're watching this video, you already know the common saying. It started with, we just want to fall in love. Then it came, we just want to get married. Then it turned
turned into bake the cake bigot. Then it turned into say my pronouns or else. That's another example of this pattern. Quote, this new position becomes gospel and the old position is forgotten, an embarrassing relic of the past, unquote. Now flash back in time to the 2000s, the years between 2000 and 2010. Imagine the social cost of saying something against gay marriage in mixed company at that time. That's a great example of this. Abortion less so, but still somewhat. Positions we used to hold that have become embarrassing. Another quote, hence the sermon that conservatism preaches is not their own, but a bastardized set of policies largely influenced and twisted by the hand of their enemies. By extension of this, the conservative actually has disdain and disgust for fellow conservatives who talk of the old position, let alone those who would utter nonsense about reclaiming that position, end quote. We've had the FBI forever. What's this nonsense about giving that up? The ATF? What, what's this nonsense about giving that up? Giving up the IRS? Are you crazy? Giving up the central bank? What are you smoking? Oh man, read a history book. Quote, if the enemies of the West seek to push madness upon the Western world as quickly as possible, conservatism is simply simply a force which slows down that madness." Unquote. Think about John McCain, Mitch McConnell, Mitt Romney, George Bush. Yeah, that's, that's largely true. Reading this in the context of 2016 without the following eight years up to 2024 being considered, without people talking a lot about the term uniparty or the term rhino, yeah, this makes complete sense. Quote, Western man needs a real alternative, a real force that can and will fight back against the enemies of the West, and one that will not cower and creep in order to play the nice guy. Unquote. And then the next false hope that the author identifies is libertarianism, something that the author sees as a tool to spread individualism. The author sees it as an attack on the concept that communities need to be unified against external threats. The thing I will say about this, though, is those in power, the people who are doing things that are definitely not in our best interest, they absolutely do not like people with a libertarian mindset. Ron Paul, Donald Trump, Tim Pool. And I suppose there's also a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction reaction here, from me at least, because I do recognize liberty as a core part of the American superego. Come and take it. But back to what the author says, libertarians favor the individual over the community. And I'll refer back to one of our founding fathers' quotes, often given today by people who want America to be a Catholic theocracy. It's the quote from John Adams that the Constitution can only work if the population is moral and upright and religious, or something to that end. I think the best way forward, at least in the American context, is to work from the ground up, encourage our neighbors to be moral, upstanding characters, self-improvement mindset, community-minded. I'm doing my own little part in my own little corner of the world. I think I'm having a good effect. I think, at least. I hope. I think working from the top down to try and have the government force people to be moral and upright, especially in America, I think that's a recipe for disaster. And something that I said, I think it's easy to take this as a joke, but I absolutely don't mean it as a joke when I say it. Do you remember recently how many times it took for the House to vote in a new speaker, how many months that ate up. People were freaking out because it took like one or two months off of the time that the House of Representatives would otherwise have had to pass legislation. Well, what legislation would they otherwise have passed? Oh, aid to Ukraine, aid to Gaza, renewing the FISA court, expanding the ATF budget. Oh, come on, dude. It is better if they do nothing. Nothing is the absolute best thing they could do. And as long as we're paying them the congressional salary and pension, they at least owe us some kind of entertainment meant something similar to a reality TV show. Back when Marjorie Taylor Greene and AOC got into that cat fight a couple months ago or a couple weeks ago, I forget when that happened, got into that little sass fest in that one committee. I salute that. I am all for that. Please derail every discussion. I don't want celebrity drama. I want congressional drama. I want nothing getting done because it is so, so seldom that Congress ever does anything good. They should get nothing done and we should further restrict their ability to get anything done and restrict the scope heavily of what they're even allowed to do. But that's my little rant. I got sidetracked from talking about working from the ground up to spread morality and the idea of self-improvement. For those of you who are religious, I will point to the book of Titus. It was Paul's advice to a church that was in a place that's known for heavy degeneracy. How are we going to thrive in this place? How are we going to practice what we preach when we're surrounded by so much filth? The answer is lead by example. Purify your own lives. Have families that are stable and functional. Don't get divorced. 
divorced, raise your kids, don't have kids out of wedlock, don't commit adultery. Make yourself the kind of person that someone in a degenerate society would look at you and think, wow, what is different about that person? Oh yeah, Jesus. I actually find it a little wild how often people try to reinvent the wheel when the Bible, and other places as well, have centuries-old, millennia-old instructions on how to deal with these situations, methods that have been tested and proven for centuries that have stood the test of time. So I recommend the book of Titus if you're concerned about the people around you being degenerate. But back to the book, the author attacks libertarianism, and he identifies the libertarian concept of the NAP, the Non-Aggression Pact, the idea that if you're not harming me, if you're not infringing on my rights directly, then I have no right to infringe on your rights. The author counters this idea by saying that when one sees something wrong in their community, they should strive to fix it. And that, again, it goes back to Titus and to a lot of other things that Paul wrote. The author writes that libertarians will outlast conservatives, but will ultimately dissolve in a sea of madness while claiming that the strong individual will be the beacon of hope. He writes that libertarians are lone individuals and cannot stand against ethnic voting blocs. He gives the examples of the Muslim communities that we see heavily influencing elections in the UK. We're beginning to see a little bit of that in America in Michigan. However, people that think that blacks and Hispanics in America are a racial voting bloc, I think the 2024 election results will surprise you in that regard. But I think the author's most fervent condemnation of libertarianism is that they have tolerance and apathy even for degeneracy. And that tolerance and apathy gives the enemies of the West wide latitude to spread degeneracy and degrade the culture. Another false hope that the author identifies is the Hollywood Nazi, or the skinhead. He identifies this as a subculture with an attached music group group, which I was not aware of, but the author states that true Nazis threatened the enemies of the West more than anything else, so the enemies of the West made them into a corrupted movement. Talks about people who drink a lot, organize in a way that makes them resemble a street gang, and basically waste their lives. Author says that real Nazis were polished, unified, and self-disciplined. Hollywood Nazis are chaotic and degenerate and disorganized. Quote, to be a national socialist is not merely to raise a flag and pay lip service to certain facets of an ideology. To be a national socialist is to live a clean and healthy lifestyle and aim to be the best you can be, physically, mentally, and spiritually." Unquote. And perhaps I am glancing over this section because it's not something I've seen personally. I don't really know what to say for or against this. Here's another quote, "...often those who are attracted to the skinhead scene are lost individuals who cannot function in society and are seeking to be part of a group of other antisocial misfits." Unquote. That is true of a lot of cults. Quote, "...the Hollywood Nazi has more in common with black inner-city gangs than he would like to admit." Unquote. I believe it was Sargon who who called a group of far-right individuals white n-word, which I thought was funny at the time. Quote, the defectives alienate nationalism from the very people it needs to attract if it is ever to grow and become a genuine alternative. End quote. Quote, this makes nationalism unattractive and pushes normal people into the arms of other false salvations. End quote. And perhaps I do know at least a little more about that aspect of it, because I know the stereotype, even if I haven't necessarily ever met one of these people. They are portrayed in movies and TV pretty much exactly how the author describes and they're made to seem angry, drunk, misguided, needlessly bigoted, maybe it's a prison gang. So in that way, in the portrayal in Hollywood more so than in real life, and that aspect of it, I do see the point how it could easily be something that was pushed from the top down. Quote, normal people who have suffered at the hands of aggressive foreign cultures do not wish to victimize or attack innocent people as a response. They wish for a disciplined and ordered response that is both lawful and fair." Unquote. I would say that is very true. And the author points out in this chapter that a lot of people talk about race wars or some kind of civil war or ethnic cleansing, but then these people who talk about it, a lot of them don't train or prepare for that. It's just hyperbolic talk online. Quote, once any cause becomes a beacon for the losers of society, that cause is destined to fail, unquote. And then following these three chapters on the three false salvations, the author pitches the true salvation of nationalism. Quote, Western man must stand against both capitalism and communism to overcome social divisions and to create a harmonious society. And at the heart of the society must be tradition, culture, and heritage, unquote. And the author does directly say that other races, other nations should also be encouraged to pursue nationalism. Each race, each nation should be encouraged to pursue the best option, the best path forward for themselves. Says that the homeland of each race is their birthright, and each race should have self-determination. Now that poses some interesting questions when you look at the contrast, like I said before, between the American continents, the New World mindset, and Europe, Asia, Africa, the Old World mindset. Because I've seen people from Patriotic Alternative take advantage of the talking point that the British people are indigenous to Britain, it is their island. But the same cannot 
cannot be said for white Americans or even black Americans about the American continent. The indigenous people here have been kept as a parallel separate society in a series of reservations, each with their own law and customs, governed by centuries-old treaties back when America was taking over the West and manifesting our destiny. I think it would be more beneficial if these people would be able to live by the same laws as everyone else without the reservation system, but that's just me. That doesn't necessarily mean giving up their culture. I know that's a big thing they talk about and they care about. There's nothing stopping them from forming ethnic enclaves and forming little neighborhoods of their own. But back to the book, back to talking about different nations having their homeland as their birthright, the author says the varying natural environments have given the races different characteristics. I do believe that to be true. I believe natural selection has given the races both different physical characteristics and different personalities, different psychological characteristics. For instance, people in the Far East, they are shorter by average. I believe, I'll have to look this up to see exactly how so this is, but they have a different ratio for the, the average length of their legs to the average length of their torso. Blacks, I know, Africans have longer legs in proportion to their torso. That causes them to be able to run faster. That's why they do well in the Olympic sprints. And of course, we're all taught in school that the amount of melanin in our skin is a result of how much sun we absorb. It's our skin's, our, our body's natural way of being able to absorb that sunlight in different amounts depending on our natural habitat. These are observable physical differences, so I don't think it's strange at all to hypothesize that there are also some mental differences. For instance, we talked about earlier the harsh European winters. I believe that has caused whites to be more conservative on average financial planners, so they think more about stockpiling, saving, investing, setting aside what you don't use today so you have it for a rainy day. When I look at my own mindset, I heavily see this. From the outside looking in, I see Far Eastern people as being more structured, more rule-abiding. Not just orderly, because Europeans can also be orderly in a way, but a lot of care for following the rules for the sake of following the rules. I see this in training martial arts. One of the people I train with is a South Korean dude, and when he learns something new, it's a little slow to catch on because he spends a lot of time making sure his posture is perfect, making sure that the muscle memory he creates is the textbook quote-unquote correct one. And contrast this to blacks that I train with, they tend to go with the flow, go with the feeling of the moment a lot more, and often that leads them to expend a lot of their energy really fast during a fight. They wear themselves out quickly and they don't have enough endurance. So that's something I try to work on. I try to work on having greater endurance so I can outlast some of those people, and then come back and pack a punch later on. And that's just some of the ways where I've seen, when I train boxing with people of different races, I do see these categories, I do see these differences in mentality play out in the way that they train and the way that they fight. The author says, Western man should respect the land, quote, nothing says more about a man than how he treats those less powerful than himself, unquote. If you remember my Princess Ononoke film review, that's where I talked about nations keeping very close track of their animal populations and making hunting quotas, giving out hunting licenses, controlling who's allowed to hunt, and doing that in the interest of preserving the population, making sure there's always a high enough population that that species is going to be available and huntable for many years to come. That's one of the ways we preserve the land and respect those less powerful than ourselves. Quote, a healthy and vibrant natural world and a connection with that world is food for the soul. Those who cut themselves off from nature and cocoon themselves in concrete separate themselves from the environment and disconnect themselves from the very world that gives them life, unquote. Some people like cities. I don't get it. Some people like the country. I do get it. I don't know what I would do if I wasn't surrounded by trees. Another quote from the book, a nation's health lies in the health of its people. Strong people build a strong nation, unquote. One of the tenets of nationalism that he already talked about earlier, people should be both physically and mentally strong and spiritually strong. And that ties in with something I believe. A strong nation is not created from the top down, and strong people are not created from the top down. You can't just mandate that everybody go to the gym so many times a week. People are going to treat it like school. They're going to treat it like a chore. There's going to be some people who take it seriously, but a lot of people are just going to go there and waste time and not be concerned with bettering their bodies. In fact, to the contrary, out of spite, they're going to be as lazy as they can get away with being. In a hypothetical world where people were mandated by the government to go to the gym so many times a week, no, I think a better way is to encourage ourselves and our families and our neighbors to change our mindset and to focus more on self-improvement. Organically, bottom-up, make these changes. If we want to live in a world where everybody goes to the gym, we need to first convince ourselves and our neighbors to do it before we start talking about how everyone everywhere should do it. Another pillar in this list of nationalism tenets, traditions are a way for ancestors to live on after death. One should always strive to connect with their past generations. And it's 
interesting if you dig into the different ways that people talk about, both now but more so historically, living on after death. So you can live on through fame, through glory in battle. You can live on through God. Compare the book of Ecclesiastes. That's a book in the Old Testament of the Bible that talks about how all of our secular pursuits in life are ultimately vain. Then that's not vain meaning in the sense of caring a lot about superficial appearance. No, that's vain, that word being used in the same way as dying in vain, dying for nothing. All our secular pursuits are for nothing. In a hundred years, where will they be? Where will this business that you spent your life building end up? Where will that big bank account end up? Where will your fancy car collection end up in a hundred years? But on the other hand, in a hundred years, we will absolutely still have the word of God, and even by some wild chance, if we don't, natural law and what Genesis and Exodus say about human psychology and human nature, those things will still remain true even if nobody is able to read those books. Other ways people talk about attaining immortality. I keep hearing, I don't know if this is just a folk story, if this is actually true, I hear that Walt Disney's body is actually frozen on ice, waiting for a time where medical technology advances enough that they can beat whatever his cause of death was. Uh, something else I hear people say, people try to get immortality through their children. And another unnatural method I've seen, I've seen people talk about the concept of having their own farms for cloned organs that are compatible with themselves, so if you ever need a heart transplant, a liver transplant, any kind of transplant at all, if you're a millionaire who has a basement full of organs from your own DNA, that would be easy for doctors to do. And that could potentially expand your lifetime quite a bit. So there's all these different ways, both healthy and natural and unhealthy and degenerate, all these different ways that people seek to attain immortality, either in the direct sense or in the indirect sense. And the healthiest way, I think both Christianity and the author's description of nationalism would agree here, would be to spread morality, have children, and pass your values down to your children, in hopes that they will pass their values down through many, many future generations. Another pillar of this ideology, the family unit is the most important thing, it is the highest thing we can strive for. Quote, to truly understand the importance of the family unit, one must only look at the heights to which those who wish to see the West fall have gone in order to damage the traditional nuclear family, unquote. Mother, father, child, that is the natural way, that is the healthiest form of a family that any human can strive for, not just Europeans. And now the author compares nationalism to communism and capitalism. He says that nationalism offers work for higher goals, communism offers work for quote-unquote higher goals, but really just for nothing, and capitalism offers work only for yourself. Quote, productive enterprise is a natural solution as it seeks to raise the standard of living for everyone, unquote. I don't necessarily see that as being exclusive to nationalism, but here's another quote. A nation must move as one, for if it moves in separate directions, it will tear itself apart, unquote. We talked about the concept of lots of people trying to pull a stone in different directions. Also talked about the idea of a beehive that has multiple bee colonies in it. One could compare that to the idea that communism presents this struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, the struggle between boss and worker, or even some things in the modern left, the struggle between different races, the struggle for gay rights. This ideology that presents so much conflict between different groups, looking from the outside in, that must be absolutely exhausting. The book ends on a pretty sizable white pill, which if you've been following Mark for a while, I don't think would be a huge surprise. His conclusion reminds me a little bit of that one meme of the guy in blackface, like coal dust blackface surrounded by a bunch of offended SJWs, and the caption is, a single based man in a cringe place can make all the difference. But that really is true, though. We can think about Art of the Deal again. Look at Trump's determination to build something productive in New York City of all places, despite the city's best intentions. Even one single person who knows how to do a good thing and is effective at doing it can make a world of difference. A Bible verse I go back to a lot is Exodus chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. This is part of the Ten Commandments. It's a footnote underneath the Third Commandment, which is the one about making images of things in heaven or below earth. Verse 5, You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Verse 6, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, my own belief, I think this stuff has a lot more to do with the here and now than a lot of people are willing to believe. If you do honorable, fruitful work, if your work results in something like building one of the wonders of the ancient world, for example, if your work results in building a national monument, or if your work is something like winning the Battle of Vienna or the Battle of Thermopylae, battles we talked about earlier in this book, or maybe not directly that, maybe your work 
just contributes to something like that. God rewards honorable, fruitful work to a thousand generations in the future. Your children will enjoy the fruits of that work long after your name is forgotten. Sin, on the other hand, if one of your grandparents cheated on their spouse, found another woman, and ran off with her, your parents are directly affected by that, having a split household. You are directly affected by your parents' parenting style on what kind of family dynamics and family values they learn from their parents. And even your kids are going to grow up hearing that story once in a while. Going back to what the author says about role models, they're going to see that grandparent as a role model positive or negative, and that's going to influence what they think is normal when they're at a young age. Sin is punished to the third and fourth generation, absolutely. And it's not some otherworldly heaven or hell that we have to close our eyes and imagine, well, it might be, I really don't know. But I see the results of this stuff right here in the world we're currently living in. So enough of my own preaching, back to the book. The author tells us to focus on breeding and raising children. He tells us family is the most important thing, the family unit, and that's something that he spent a lot of time in this book focusing on. But more than just that, he encourages us to better ourselves. Quote, we must become writers, artists, poets, athletes, and captains of industry, unquote. Quote, once you have become the best you can be, join with others who share your goals and who also seek excellence, unquote. And just those two quotes, that's the kind of thing that the coach at my gym talks about every week. Literally every week he gives a quote, something along those lines. Both surrounding yourself with like-minded people and motivated people, and then picking a North Star, as he calls it, picking a goal, picking where you want to see yourself in five or ten years, writing that on a piece of paper and pinning it up someplace where where you're going to look at it every day and you're going to be reminded this is where I want to see myself in order to get here I need to do this and this and this on this day. It's the idea of waking up and knowing exactly what you need to do in order to be one step closer to that goal. Now here's the part where I think it gets really interesting quote we are surrounded by so much poison and filth that it would be impossible for it not to affect us in some way unquote or as Jesus would put it not one of us is free from sin quote despite some of the truths in this book being difficult to swallow they are truths nonetheless, but we have all made mistakes in our lives, and not one of us is perfect, unquote. This is sounding really familiar, isn't it? Quote, the ability to take criticism is the mark of a mentally developed and well-rounded adult, unquote. This is sounding a lot like 1 Corinthians. Quote, we must look at ourselves and assess how we have been affected by the ideological poison that has been fed to us. But in doing so, we must be brutally honest, and we must not fear admitting to the mistakes that we have made, unquote. This is sounding a lot like 1 Corinthians. Quote, only he is lost who gives himself up for lost, unquote. That sounds like Romans 1. Quote, as long as Western man has a will to fight and a will to survive, he can seek redemption, unquote. All of this sounds a lot like Paul's epistles. This conclusion, when I was reading it and going through it, struck me as a secular version of the New Testament, trying to recreate the concepts of salvation and forgiveness, but doing it without the spiritual aspect attached to it, making it a purely political concept rather than something that's fully fleshed out for every single part of our lives. But I will humor it for a second, and I will give a... Think of it as a voluntary optional project you can embark on if you like. Many churches, when people come to it, when they tell the priest, hey, I've made mistakes in my life, but I want to turn myself around, I want to get baptized, I want to follow Jesus, the thing that they have to do, if you think of baptism class as a class like we used to have in school, you can think of the final project as what we call a faith story. And the idea is you're supposed to write up a short, or long if you want, story about how you decided to come to Jesus. Now, to anyone listening, you might guess I'm about to suggest doing this in a secular way, writing up sort of a politics story as opposed to a faith story. I myself have actually done this. I did find it very fruitful. It's a good way to examine myself, I've found, to examine how I've evolved over the years and to get to know myself better, get to know the tendencies with the way I think. Get a good feel for how much of my thinking was influenced from the outside and how much of it was an inevitability that I would end up sort of around the place where I'm at today politically. I think a lot of that was an inevitability. I think there was always somehow, some way, no matter what time and place I was born at, I think there was always going to be a tendency for me to gravitate towards right libertarianism on that political compass thing. But you can do that for yourself if you want. Share it with a friend, maybe. Don't underestimate the value of grounding yourself, the value of looking inward, examining what you believe, examining who you are, examining your strategy for how to go about further 
furthering your goals in the real world. Jesus spent 40 days in the desert doing exactly that before he started preaching. You might think of it like looking at a map. You have to find where you're at on the map before you can figure out exactly where you want to be and which road you want to take to get there. So I do encourage you to write this faith story or political story or whatever you want to call it because it's a process of finding where you are at on that map. So now this leaves us with my own conclusions to this book as a whole. I have a bunch of different scattered thoughts here. First up, obviously the length of this video. This book is different from reviewing a piece of fiction or even a piece of non-fiction in most cases. This book is a political manifesto. It's an illustration of all the tenets of a political ideology. And being what it is, it's hard to do it justice without covering all those main points. So I made a call going into this. I decided this is gonna run long. I'm gonna cover all the nitty-gritty details of this book, and I'm not really gonna shy away from doing too many tangents. And overall, in the end, I think it turned out okay. I think that was a good decision. We'll see what the audience thinks. One topic I thought was interesting was comparing it to something I wrote that, unfortunately for you, is not public at the moment. When I reach out to the author to let him know I did this review, I will share that with him. It's on the shorter side. It's a, a long booklet, I would call it. It amounts to a collection of political essays, and one of the main points that carries through the multitude of those essays is this idea that the millennial and to some extent the Zoomer right wing are reinventing the wheel. We're trying to figure out how to rebuild the pillars of tradition that have upheld society for centuries because we see the one or two generations that came immediately before us as defective, as not having adequately transferred in Colette's vocabulary the superego. We see a world with transgenderism, with economic failure, with governments forcing people to get vaccinated scenes. We see a world, a society with failure on every level, moral, industrial, diplomatic failure, and the people in their 30s and younger on the right wing, subconsciously or not, they place a large amount of blame on the Gen X and the boomers. So in that booklet, I identify sort of a vacuum for superego, a self-imposed vacuum, perhaps, and I describe how lots of people recognize the problem, but very few people agree on the solution. So there's people turning to Islam, people turning to Mark Collette, people turning to Nick Fuentes, people turning to the Catholic Church. There's all sorts of different ways of thinking, and no two are exactly alike if you examine them closely. But if you compare this vacuum to the vocabulary from this book with the superego, I think it hits on an interesting harmonious note that I wouldn't have expected. Something I expect to get a lot of disagreement on from Mark's fans is, or perhaps not so many of them will disagree with me on this, it's my insistence that we cannot change society or change change culture from the top down. We can't do it by having government force a law on people who do not want that law. We have to go from the bottom up. We have to get people educated to a large enough extent that having government follow the will of the people is the easiest thing in the world once we get to that point. And I say I expected pushback on that because it's something I talk about frequently with my own friends here in the States. It's a frequent point of contention, particularly with the people who watch Michael Knowles, the people who want a Catholic theocracy in America, essentially. One of Noel's favorite phrases is the law is a teacher, meaning it's an illustration of his theory that, take abortion for example, if we get a state that criminalizes abortion, then the number of abortions in that state will drop. It's a claim that people look to the law when they decide moral issues. They allow their morality to be heavily influenced by the law. And that statement is a direct contrast to politics as downstream from culture. If you have a law that does not fit the society, that simply the population does not accept, it is very hard to enforce that law. If you have a law that prosecutors, that police, that juries just don't agree with, you're going to have a lot of roadblocks on the way to actually putting someone in jail for violating that law. And I wanted to point out one thing as a positive example for how to change minds on the ground. It's a guy named Daryl Davis. Now he was, he had his 15 minutes of fame back in, oh, I'd say the time between 2012 and 2016. There were memes going around. This guy single-handedly deconverted hundreds of KKK members. And it's this big, jolly fat black guy, jazz musician. And if you look him up, he has a TED talk. He has multiple books about this. The memes are actually true. He actually did, he explains in his TED talk, he actually did ask himself, how is it possible? possible for someone to hate me just because of the color of my skin, and then he goes out and starts asking white supremacists these questions, has meetings with dozens of KKK members, talks about in particular one time he had a meeting with someone who was high-ranking in that group, and they met in a hotel room, and there was one of those buckets with a champagne bottle sitting on ice, and 
and there was a point in that meeting where the ice melted just enough that the the weight of the champagne pushed the ice down and it made one you know that crumbling sound that no one expects when it comes but there was so much tension in the room that the kkk guy and his two bodyguards like jumped and almost shot him because they heard the sound of the ice and they didn't know what was going on this guy daryl davis had those meetings went in there genuinely curious talked to people ended up becoming friends with a lot of them and he has on display a collection of robes of clan robes people who used to be in the clan they gave it up because of their friendship with davis and they made a gift to him of their clan robes now whether or not you agree disagree with the kkk you can see this is a roadmap towards convincing people of our way of thinking if we want to convince people that taking hormones and mutilating their genitals is wrong we're going to get a lot further by actually talking to them human to human rather than just doing the same old cope see dilate online okay that's funny but if the goal is to change minds if the goal is to turn this place into a better world well if we want a world where people don't do that we either have to change minds or get rid of the people who do that kill them i don't want to kill anybody i would much rather change minds so you can take this example and we can apply it to any number of issues immigration any number of issues a place where I think a member of this ideology could take an effective jab at my way of thinking is the idea that the American superego is not one that's receptive to racial politics. For instance, if someone tells me that America is a white country, I'm going to point out Daryl Davis and say, he is American, I don't see any valid way to deny him being American. And people I know who are second or third generation immigrants, I don't see any valid way to deny them being American. Americanism, I see it as a belief in the ideals of our revolution. I do not believe that's exclusive to whites. In fact, I have a hard time even defining white, because if you look back not too many generations past, they look at my own family, I have Italian Catholic and German Protestant that are married. That was a minor problem at the time. Back a little bit further, there was French Huguenot and Italian Catholic that intermarried. That was a huge problem at the time. Someone actually got disowned over that one. Four or five generations ago, my ancestors would not have understood each other's language. So, if you talk about the American white race, are we talking German? Are we talking Scottish? Are we talking English? Irish? Polish? Italian? What are we talking here? And I do recognize bringing up that point also waters down our defense against the left, because they do see it, or at least present it, as a white versus non-white thing. But I still just don't think that white nationalism is going to work on this continent. In Britain, in Germany, I think there's potential there. In Asia, in Africa, definitely ethno-nationalism has a place, I don't think Americans are going to accept it in any of our lifetimes. At least not on any kind of wide scale. Instead, we're going to see Trump, we're going to see Ron Paul, we're going to see Barry Goldwater. We're going to see populistic groups that don't even think to make mention of race, maybe as an afterthought, maybe only if they're forced to focus on race because their opponents drag race into the issue, but groups that mainly focus on limiting the scope of government to something that the original drafters of the Constitution something closer to what they would have intended. That's how we're going to get successful political movements in America. But it does beg the question, the idea of an American superego based around freedom rather than race, is that superego easier to crack than one that's focused more on an ethnic group and focused on that ethnic group's claim to a piece of land that they've lived on for thousands of years? Well, I might point out and ask which side of the pond has been having more political success, but then again, I don't think that's exactly fair because I think I think Trump is a unique individual. He's a wild card. If we didn't have Trump, we definitely wouldn't be doing as good as we are, and we might be even in a similar shape or maybe worse than how you guys are over there with your recent election. Tory goal, zero seats. So really, I don't know. I would say if I had to just take a wild guess, I would say they're probably about the same in resilience to that particular type of attack, the type of attack that we're seeing now. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up is how closely the author's conclusion to this book mirrors the tenets of Christianity. And I looked up recently an interview that Mark did a few years back. It was an American giving him an interview, and there was one point in that interview the guy asked him, sort of as a side question, hey, are you Christian? And Mark said yes right away. And I wouldn't have been able to tell that by listening to his podcast alone, because he brings it up so seldom, I would have been able to tell it by reading this book. That wouldn't have been a direct 
confirmation, but rather an inference based on the things that he writes about. I would have been able to say that at the very least he's well read on this stuff, even if he doesn't attend church regularly. But it points to something I see as a possible cultural difference. I haven't talked to enough people to be able to pinpoint whether or not this is actually the case, but possible cultural difference that the old right, the Gen X and the boomers in America, are definitely more religious, or at the very least more outwardly religious, while I get the impression that people in the UK are more quiet about that sort of thing, or maybe they attend church less. Because I see this as evidence, and then I see, I remember years back, one of the videos on Sargon's channel, he was talking about how Britain is a majority atheist nation, and then I see this whole idea that I think would do well if it coupled itself with religion, but for some reason doesn't. And I'm wondering if that's just a British-ism, because I meet with boomers and Gen Xers over here for local politics, for local activism. We talk about things in our county, things in our state, things that we can take direct action on. We have meetings about this stuff, and before the meetings, I would say more than half of the meetings, at least one person would stop everyone before the meeting starts and say, hey, let's take a moment of prayer, let's bow our heads. God, please give us discernment. God, please give us success in what we're doing, please guide us on the right path, make sure we're doing the right thing, please give wisdom to our leaders, help them see the right path. That's just a thing over here, that's just a thing that people on the right wing specifically do. And I haven't spoken face to face with enough people who do local politics over in the UK to be able to pinpoint whether or not that is a cultural difference. But as long as we're on this topic, let me wax religious one more time and talk about at least one of the psychological benefits of prayer, as opposed to just just talking to God, it's a way to center ourselves. I talked about earlier having that North Star, that goal that you follow, the reason to get up in the morning, the roadmap to show you what you can do each day to be one step closer to your goal. Prayer can be a tool to focus yourself, apart from just talking to God, focus yourself on that goal. To clear your mind and ask yourself not what the id wants, not what the ego wants, but ask yourself what God wants, what the superego wants, in any given moment, in any given situation. And then I gave the example of Jesus spending 40 days in the desert. I said, do not underestimate the power of that focusing of yourself, the power of taking time to orient yourself, to identify your goals, to identify how you want to get there. That orientation of yourself is more important than the action itself, because if you just go out without a plan, you're going to be all over the place. And now the last the last thing I want to bring up is, a year or two ago I read a book called The Four Loves by C.S. Lewis. And comparing what I remember of that book to a lot of the points the Patriotic Alternative brings up, I am as certain as I can be that Mark has read and thoroughly enjoyed that book as well. It's one of England's famous writers, so I think Mark would have read it or at least known of it. And apart from talking about God, it talks about love of country specifically, the love of the land, love of your culture, among other things. Different kinds of interpersonal relationships, different kinds of love. So if you're interested in further reading, that may be a book to turn to. In other news, Wow, I thought this recording would go on forever. I'm excited to see what everyone thinks.